and we got a good one for you guys. Uh, got obviously our normal sports talk, and then whenever we're done with the normal stuff, NFL mock draft special, probably about an hour, the whole second hour. So it should be a good one. I mentioned it last week. This is like my second favorite show of the year. I just love the NFL draft. I'm obsessed with it. I'm so glad that this is, you know, we're in the week of the NFL draft and. It's not till Thursday, so Nick's got a few days yeah. to, to salivate over the big boards and the box uh, un, un, until uh, the, the first name is called. And everybody seems to know who it, it, that, that name will be uh, come Thursday. So it, it'll be pretty exciting uh, thereafter. But um, we got a big show, dropping the hottest takes in Bonaventure for the first hour, and then the hottest takes – that you can find about the NFL draft in the second hour. It's going to be a fun show. Yeah, and let's get right into it. We're actually going to start with the NFL, but not draft talk. Well, a little bit of draft talk, but not the actual mock draft special that we're doing. Um, there was a big trade Friday. It actually worked out perfectly. We had a sports staffer show that Friday. I don't know if you guys were able to take a listen, but we had a Ravens fan on there, so he had his live reaction. Oh, that's right. Um, so what I'm alluding to, Star left tackle or offensive tackle Orlando Brown trade from the Ravens to the Chiefs. The Ravens got the Chiefs first round pick in this year's draft and they uh, swapped back and forth some other picks. But obviously the headline is a first round pick and Orlando Brown. Tyler, this was a big pickup to the, from, for the Chiefs. What are your thoughts? My first thoughts, why are the Ravens giving the Chiefs the best offensive tackle that is being shopped around right now, whether it be free agent or, or by trade like we saw? The Ravens are looking to compete in the AFC. And, I mean, as, as long as you have a star quarterback, and, I mean, Lamar Jackson is very much considered a star quarterback, if you have him on the roster, you're looking to compete for Super Bowls year in and year out. Why do you give them to the team that was rivaling your best offense two years ago? It, it, it raises some eyebrows to me. I, I, I thought that they'd find um, somewhere else that he could go play left tackle. I'm sure there's a ton of suitors. Who are out there, but obviously the Chiefs really don't care about draft capital all that much. They have largely the same roster in place, and then not only have they signed guys like Joe Thumi and, and other replacements on the offensive line, now they're going trade hunting, spending the draft capital that they, that they really don't need of, these, of this next window of, of Patrick Mahomes' career, and getting Orlando Brown, the guy who will be protecting him over the next couple of years, because they said he'll uh, he'll be receiving a contract extension upon arrival in Kansas City. He just passes. And now he's ready to suit up at left tackle for the Chiefs. Phenomenal move by Kansas City. Who keeps letting them get these players? I I, I don't get it. Uh, Ozzy Newsome, GM of the Ravens. He he seems like the next man to fall victim. But you know when you look at what they got back, it, it makes sense. It's just when you're sending it to a, your one of your biggest competitors, if not your biggest competitor in the conference, raises a couple questions. Yeah. Obviously, Orlando Brown Jr., he wanted out. It was public. The Ravens... It's public during the regular season. Yeah, the, the Ravens basically like said that, yeah, they're going to move on from him this offseason because he wanted out. So you knew it was coming. I didn't expect it to go to the Chiefs, though. This now completes... You mentioned Joe, Joe Tooney. Probably the best left side uh, on the offensive line in football with Orlando Brown Jr. left tackle and Joe Tooney at left guard. Um, they still have a pretty solid uh, offensive line outside of those two, too. So it's going to be dangerous because obviously everyone saw what happened in the Super Bowl. They're not; they weren't going to let that happen again. There's that that can be like <laughs> if you knew anything going into this offseason, which has been a wild one. It was that the Chiefs were going to make uh, sure Patrick Mahomes was protected. Uh, I was actually surprised that the Ravens were able to get a first round pick out of this. Orlando Brown deserve is a deserving player of a first round pick, but when you have someone who publicly demands a trade. It's like you don't have there's the team that's trading him doesn't able to get a first round pick along with some other mid round picks. Were you surprised with that? Well, uh, I'm not surprised that. Well, I am surprised that they got a first round pick out of it. Um, you know what? You know what my theory is now that I'm thinking about it is that there were other suitors and, and teams who were throwing out maybe multiple seconds, uh, other day two picks, and. The Chiefs were hearing about these deals, and they were like, you know what? The only way that we can get Orlando Brown is if we throw in a first-round pick, and I guess that's what they did, and, and that's that's the reason the Ravens got it. Because if, if other teams are throwing out first-round picks, why would you send them to the Chiefs? So if – That's exactly what my thought process if, was, too. If the Chiefs are the only team throwing out a first, then I, I guess they have no choice but to accept the deal is, is where I'm thinking. Yeah, because when you're – especially because there's like – 
I wouldn't say rivalry building. Maybe you can say that. Like, they're two young quarterbacks. They're going to the best teams the past two years. They're obviously going to, like, square up against each other a lot. So it's weird to throw that to your potential new rival in the AFC, someone you're going to have to go through to get to the Super Bowl potentially. But uh, I actually like what the Ravens did because, obviously, like I said, it was publicly traded. He probably wasn't going to play even if they didn't end up trading him this upcoming season. Uh, they have Ronnie Staley towards ACL, but he's very good as an offensive line uh, tackle. They probably need to add one more, and that's where we're going to get into right now is with Baltimore now having two first-round picks, 27 and 31. What will they do? There's two different situations in mind, obviously, when it guards the, this upcoming first round Thursday. They can either stay put at 27 and 31, draft a wide receiver, because they obviously need wide receiver very, very bad to pair up with Marquise Brown and give Lamar Jackson weapons and an offensive tackle to replace Orlando Brown? Or do they package the two first-round picks, move up, draft a higher wide receiver than they would get at 27, or a higher offensive lineman than they would get at 27-31? What are your thoughts? So you just listed to me two possibilities the Ravens could do on draft night that both make a ton of sense. And what I've noticed about the NFL draft is that when teams teams' decisions aren't clear – when the picks are made. So the Orlando, I mean, not Orlando, uh, Baltimore, whatever they're going to do on draft night, um, usually they're, for, I mean, they picked Patrick Queen in the first round last year, uh, pretty, pretty solid uh, rookie performance out of him. But, you know, when teams are, are picking, especially late in the first round, they never really seem to draft like other positions of need. It, it more comes on best player on the board. But you mentioned wide receiver and offensive tackle. Those are two positions that, not only are, are, are desperately needed in Baltimore, but two positions that are, I'm sure Lamar Jackson has re- relayed to the front office and the coaching staff that he wants on the team. And, you know, we talked about it months ago with, with Russell Wilson and how he's, um, his participation in front office and coaching decisions. Uh, you know, you have a guy like Lamar Jackson who's going to be there. He already won MVP for your franchise, uh, led them to the best record in the NFL. He's going to be there for the next decade or as long as he can stay healthy. Um, and he's got to be in, in on these decisions. So, therefore, do I think that they go tackle wide receiver? Obviously, it depends on who's on the board at the time. But um, th- that would be the best plan of action for, for the Ravens. Do I think that they do it? No. Do I think that they package the two picks and move up? Probably not either. It's going to be something that, that you know, t- that they have two picks, that like five picks away. And they're going to do something that nobody really expects. And, and that, that's where I'm kind of getting at with the Ravens right now. Yeah. My thing is, I, would the two first-round picks be enough to move out up to pick number 11, no, potentially? No, you don't no, think so? No. Um, it depends. Uh, Giants are at number 11, right? Correct. And they need a lot. So, do like, here's the thing with the Giants is that they need some help on the defensive side of the ball, and they need – potentially another playmaker like they could go wide receiver um but like if the ravens were somehow able to package those two first round picks move into 11 where potentially Devontae smith falls to that would be a fantastic addition alongside mark andrews and marquise brown that would provide the weapons or i'd say that would complete the weapons lamar jackson would need I don't know how much I love the Devonta Smith. Now, now that's just obviously an example that you're throwing out there, but that is probably the receiver that I think that would be available at 11. Um, out of those t- big three. Out of the big three, yeah. Wait, you just you, th- you think Waddle goes right uh, before Smith? Yeah, I think he does. Well, I um I think Smith will be a better NFL wide receiver, but just based off what I've been reading, what I've been hearing, I believe. Devontae Smith is going to end up being the last one drafted out of those three. Because now everyone chases speed because of Tyree Kill. Like Tyree, you talk about Steph Curry changing the NBA. Tyree Kill is borderline changing the NFL with how fast he is. Absolutely. All those teams are craving wide receiver speed. Like there's no way if Tyree Kill wasn't as good as he is in the NFL. Henry Ruggs last year over Jerry, yeah, yeah, over Jerry Judy and C D Lynn. And Justin Jefferson. Right. Like the speed people chase speed and Jalen Waddle's the fastest out of those three. He's not going to go the best, uh, the earliest because Jamar Chase is just a different breed. Yeah. But Waddle is going to go ahead of his t- uh, college teammate because of the speed. 
I agree. Uh, I, I can agree with that to all wholeheartedly. Was Ruggs the first uh, receiver off the board last year? He was, yeah. Because oh there was the, they, there was a big three this year of uh, Jamar Chase, yeah. Devontae Smith, and uh, Waddle. And then there was a big three last year of – and because like this wasn't even considered like Justin Jefferson was considered to be a good like first round talent, but he wasn't like like wasn't the biggest name. yeah because Jamar, Jamar Chase was a player cop winner I mean, yeah he right was he was the number one receiver like yeah Justin Jefferson wasn't even the best player wide receiver on his team when uh, his final year in LSU just crazy but it's true and then uh the so the big three was Rugs. Uh, C.D. Lamb and Jerry Judy, and I thought Ruggs would go the last out of all of them because Jerry Judy and uh, C.D. Lamb were so like polished with its route running along with speed. But they ended up going with Ruggs. Uh, I would say the Raiders might regret that, but I I, I don't know that. But that's either way. Uh, Smith is probably going to be the third wide receiver taken uh, out of that group. I would assume. I wish the Ravens would trade up for him. I doubt it. It would be entertaining to see. So I was saying that it would be entertaining to see, absolutely. And then, you, then you have then you slide Marquise Hollywood Brown to the, to the two spot. But I, I don't know how well that, especially for Lamar Jackson, who's going to need to put the ball on the outside of the field. Um, is Devonta Smith being an undersized, not undersized height wise, but undersized weight wise, a great pairing with a five nine undersized Hollywood Brown? That's that's my concern there. I guess I get that concern, but. People, other people buy into Devontae Smith's lack of frame, lack of weight, but with his wingspan, his uh, hands, yeah, his, catch rate is just his ability to get – like even though it's still in college, it would, like when the frame you question injuries and is he going to be able to get jammed at the line of scrimmage, if you watch his tape, like he doesn't – he's able to beat if, if the, the corner no matter how they played him. So – I, I'm not as concerned about his weight and like build as other people because because of that catch radius. I, I agree. I mean, he's a dynamic talent, and, the, and it, once you get in the open field, it's right. Much like, over, yeah, so. he's so elusive. Yeah, that the, any of those three receivers, and you know what? Uh, I'm thinking of my guy. I don't know how far he'll fall. I don't think he'll make it to 27. What are the, the Ravens of 27 and 31? Correct. Okay, so yeah, I don't think my guy Rashad Bateman makes it to 31. So uh, if the Ravens do end up keeping the picks, I would like to see them try to nap him with, with 27, see what kind of offensive line availability is around 31. It's true. They um, could – I don't know. I, it wouldn't take both first-round picks, but they could package maybe 27 and like a third-round pick yeah. to move up to, say, 23. And Bateman would be And there. maybe Bateman would be there. Yeah. I don't know. The, Bateman is interesting to me. I he, told you he's my, he's my favorite prospect out of all of them. He, when we get to our mock draft, I'll, I have him going decently early. Mm-hmm. I'll say that. Like, I think he's going to be very good as well. Yeah. I, I, I Again, obviously, I, I believe Rashad Bateman is going to turn out the best pro. But when we do our mock drafts, I'm not saying where these guys should go. I'm saying where I think they will go. That, yeah. That, so, I, I was going to say that before we got into our that. mock draft. Because okay. like, so, obviously, there's mock drafts where, like, I think or, I mean, what I think should happen. And then what – actually probably we're gonna we're trying to guess on what will happen yeah like i said before if none of these teams on draft night do they, they take moves that nobody really expects or understands on the first night that it happens but then once the season comes around they either pan out or everybody was right on draft night so we'll see what happens Intriguing prospect as to where he goes in the first round yeah let's move on to our next topic uh this one is still about the draft the 49ers obviously probably hold the most interesting pick. It's they're, we know they're drafting a quarterback, but which quarterback is like been what the top uh, topic and and what people are talking about? Uh, it was a report that came out I think yesterday. I don't know if it was yesterday or early this morning. Uh, I lost track of time, but apparently they have narrowed in, and this is according to the actual insider. They've narrowed in on Trey Lance or Mac Jones. Do you buy that? Or is this a smokescreen? I, I I mean, I don't buy that, that Lance and Jones couldn't be the pick there because they both of them could. I, I I still think it's a toss-up. I really do. I have no idea what Kyle Shanahan and John Lynch are going to do. I, I, it's, it's been the smokiest smokescreen of all time uh, leading up to the draft. I mean, they've been to everybody's pro day. They've seen everybody in college except for, obviously, Trey Lance this year. Um so they could go any other route. I honestly would lean more towards Jones or Fields. I don't think they go Lance three. 
I see. This is my I what I uh I, on the Stafford show because I hosted it last Friday. We had this discussion before these reports came out, like which quarterback should go three. I said that analysts believe it's Mac Jones. I think they should take Justin Fields, and what I thought they are gonna do is take Trey Lance. Oh, so you got all three exactly covered. Okay. I I still don't know. I think I'm I'm gonna reveal it when we do our mock draft. But I've kind of changed my tune on what I think the 49ers are going to do. Yeah, it's not a spoiler, but I will I will actually agree with you. I do believe that they should take Justin Fields. I think he's the most I, yeah. out of all three. Um, I also think he has the highest potential. Yeah, and I, I, I think he could be very dynamic. I think you could do a lot of things with him in an offense that you can't do with Mac Jones or Trey Lance. Now, those guys might be more prototypical, uh, you know, drop back quarterbacks. But Justin Fields is a very dynamic athlete. And, he, he's, and I'll tell you right now, Justin Fields will sell more than – Trey Lance or Mac Jones. So it, Trey Lance has the opportunity to be a guy who just blossoms and, and becomes this freak athlete. But I think Justin Fields, you kind of know what you're getting off the rip. Uh, I, I, I do think that more than I think of Mac Jones, honestly, because you look at his teammates in college, the, the offensive line that protected him, the coaching staff that, that brought him up, there hasn't been a single Alabama quarterback. And, and listen, the, the jury's still out on Tua, but there hasn't been a single Alabama quarterback with success. I, I couldn't name you when. So, I mean, if Mac Jones is different, then awesome. That, that, that's awesome for him, and I hope he succeeds in the NFL. And I'm not wishing any ill will on him just because he's an Alabama quarterback, but there just hasn't been proof of success from the Crimson Tide at the quarterback position in the NFL in a long time. I mean, I couldn't name it. Yeah, and the same thing could be said for uh, Ohio State, to be honest. You're, you're kind of right. You, you are, you are kind of right. Um, well, the, see, the, the schools that these three quarterbacks go to are interesting. Yeah. Actually, you could put in four. I mean, Zach Wilson, BYU is the clear cut number two, but like that's still. Are we are we calling Joe Burrow an Ohio State alum? Uh, well, <laughs> no, nah, I wouldn't go that far. Stick, right? But uh, anyway, you haven't seen like a good like main Ohio State quarterback a good and be good in the NFL in a while. North Dakota State, you had Carson once, but these two are really the only quarterbacks to like make a difference. And I guess said Trey Lance, you could already say making a difference because how high of a pick he's going to be. And then you got uh, Mac Jones with Alabama quarterbacks has been terrible. And huh. like you said, Jerry's still out on him. I have a interesting history within the NFL. Well, I will say that Justin Fields was not originally a uh, Alabama That's true. Or That's true. State guy. He Couldn't. was a – Georgia guy. Couldn't Georgia beat out Jake Ford. Fromm. Yeah, well, I was going to say, give me a free shot. I, I threw you a softball there. I give, give it a shout-out to Jake Fromm. But Matt Stafford, obviously, uh, a Georgia product. That's so true. He was pegged to go there uh, and then obviously got beat up by, by Nick's best friend. Um, then he you know, makes the move to Ohio State, goes, makes multiple runs to the college football playoff, and he's consistently talked about as you know the number two guy to Trevor Lawrence ever since he's started in college. So I, I don't know why the public opinion has just shifted uh, ever since his last college game because he didn't play bad against Alabama. He didn't. He played amazing against Clemson. Yeah, he balled um, out. He outplayed so, Trevor Lawrence. Yeah, yeah and, he, and he beat Trevor Lawrence head to head. So uh, obviously he he had the interception last year, but Justin Fields why shifted after we've seen him off the field? Like I, I he's never had any off the field issues. It seems like this is kind of the Sean Watson thing that's going on, and I hate to bring up the Sean Watson, but the, the, he he fell uh, in 2017 for no reason. It seemed like I mean he's just coming off a national championship, a Heisman runner up, and he, he falls all the way to number ten. Um, so it, it's weird how, how how quarterbacks are evaluated um, post collegiate career because Justin Fields doesn't seem to have done anything, in my opinion, that has harbored his draft standing. But I guess analysts think that, think otherwise. Right. And before we move on and take a break, one last thing was because in our mock drafts, we're not doing trades because it's too unpredictable and will cause chaos. So we're just going to keep it how the picks are, even though I will put my life savings on there being a trade up. And you always see someone trade up like in the like the picks 25 through 32 at the end from someone who doesn't have a pick and is like oh this person's still there I want to grab him before day two you see that but I'm talking about big trade up what teams could you see trade up in the draft I'll just list off you're probably going to agree with me but at least two of them I'll agree if you have them I'll yeah agree. I think I think the top four teams of trading up are going to be the Patriots mm -hmm. the Washington football team the Bears and the Steelers Okay, so the Steelers and the Pats are the two teams, and I, especially especially because they're moving up from such a 
higher um, spot. They're moving up from the, from the 20s. Or Pats had, what, 15? Yeah, 15. Okay, so that's, that's So actually, that's out of those really four teams, good. I made the pe- Patriots have the highest pick. Oh, really? Well, you, you hear those four teams, and you say the Patriots yeah, have the highest no, pick. You're like, what? Just, just muscle memory. <laughs> I, I didn't really uh, understand that. But, yeah, I would say the Pats, I mean, it all depends on how the top 10 shakes out. Like, Because I don't think any of those teams are moving up to number four. Or number mm, number eight could happen because I think I think a quarterback could fall there. Um, I don't know if you saw. Did you see the? Um, it was Ian Rappaport was at the draft stage, and there was um, like a just a graphic, you know, where, where the where the player's name would be selected, and it was Washington Football Team colors, and it said round one pick eight. Interesting. So, and Carolina's been lo- known to be shopping uh, the number eight pick. Yeah. But- there's like two teams. The the Falcons were open to trading back, and the Panthers were openly like publicly publicly like, okay, yeah, if you guys want to trade up here, like, we'll, well do there it. There are two teams who need a lot of work in a lot of areas, and I mean the Falcons. You want to talk about them wanting to move out of four? Not only do, do they want to do that, they want to get rid of Julio Jones now. Yeah. Did you see that won't happen if he gets moved until after June first? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I wonder. I, I wonder if they do because because it's gonna have to involve draft picks. So are they gonna you would agree think. To in principle? Like, there's no way Julio Jones just goes for. You a, could do it in principle, yeah. but my thing is, what if someone does a mega package, goes up to four, and and gets Julio and does a mega package, and like, if it's not in principle, and you have to wait a whole month from when the potential quarterback at four because if you move up to four you're probably taking a quarterback yeah. where to get drafted uh, he's pr- not allowed to probably work with the team that traded up that's what i'm saying he's not allowed to do that so i mean after, when, after yeah. OTAs, it would have to be after otas because that's in may um so, so June yeah first, and then you're you're basically without the team at least as a whole until training camp so if it's a straight up trade for julio it could be done in principle Maybe I don't know. It's very confusing. Or maybe the Falcons are just dumb and just eat the cap money. Who cares? I mean, the Falcons and dumb have been synonymous for a couple of years. Because my so. first thought process, I was like, "Oh my God, Patriots, just pull the trigger. Send send like three firsts and J.C. Jackson and a couple like day three picks. Do it. Number fifteen comes. Well, yeah, fifteen. Your next two firsts and like two uh, third round picks send it for Julio in the fourth. I'm um, like don't take risks like No, that. I know he doesn't. Like that. But crazy. if I was a GM, I'm oh, I mean, I'm no, sending we, it. We play like that. You so. give me you give me Julio and one of those rookie quarterbacks? Come on. Take the whole take, take the next decade of first. Come on. Uh, I'll pull the trigger. Well, I mean, but listen, I mean, one thing I will say about Julio, he's not the youngest guy. Anyway. No, yeah, he is. He's like 30. You'd get like three good years Three out of him. Solid year. Yeah. And it's, it's, not, it's not like this is a guy who's been squeaking thin uh, as far as injuries go. Right. Yeah. Either. So I would. We'll I'll be intrigued to see what his uh, draft or his value is. I saw P. Number thirty, like that's so. Uh, that's that's the, the most I could think of. Yeah, I don't know. Well, we're gonna head to break. When we come back, we talk quick MLB in this week in this league. So stay tuned on WSBU eighty-eight point three, the Bucks.
Welcome back to WSBU 88.3 The Buzz from St. Bonaventure University. You're listening to Director Scott with Nick Roloff and Tyler Smith. First little bit, we talked all the news around the NFL outside of our actual mock drafts. And it's time to get into some MLB talk. A wild weekend in the MLB, to be honest with Tyler. It was actually really fun. As far as, as far as the MLB regular season goes, like it's not the most exciting time ever. Baseball was exciting this weekend. It was. Wild weekend. I mean, see. I don't know if you uh, – he just went to the Friday-Saturday games, right? Yeah, it was Friday-Saturday. He went to Yankees-Indians Thursday. Oh, really? Yeah. So he made the rounds. He was going crazy. Uh, but he got to watch the best pitcher of our generation. I was going to put this in here, but I think it would have uh, taken too much time because there's obviously the talk. Like, DeGrom's been unreal. This is on a side tangent here, but Kershaw was unreal like six, seven years ago. Like. Yeah. Who's better in their prime, Kershaw or DeGrom? Kershaw has three Cy Youngs. DeGrom's on his way to his third this year. It's a real debate. I think you can get into it. As far as primes go? Yeah, it's like who's better, like DeGrom from his first Cy Young year to now, which has been a four-year stretch, or Kershaw's best four years? Interesting. It's going to be tough. I'm a velocity guy. I think that, that's, why, that's why I have a soft spot for DeGrom in that, in that argument. So. Well, I mean, DeGrom's velocity is like a he's a Benjamin Button. He, he throws 100 miles an hour in the ninth inning. Like, yeah. Just, when, and when he came up as a young pitcher, he like threw 95 in like 2015. So he's just, he just elevated himself. Correct. As he's gotten older, his velocity has taken an uptick, which is – like the complete opposite of what usually happens. Like he's unreal. I don't. I think I'd be knowing that I have Degrom on the Mets for like my whole life. If I like went back in time and he wasn't on the Mets, I think I'd be depressed. Oh yeah. <laughs> That's, I mean, All right. Generational talent. Either way, other pitching numbers. Madison Bumgarner threw a no hitter in a seven inning doubleheader game yesterday, but it is not recognized by the MLB as an official no hitter because it's a seven inning game. My question to you, Tyler, should it be credited as an official no-hitter? Is the game credited in the standings? That's that's the point of people that are... Is the game scheduled to be seven innings? Yes. Our, our double-headers for the rest of time, apparently, are uh, going to be seven innings and then nine. Yeah, or are they both seven innings and double-headers? They're both seven innings. They're both seven. All right, so they're all double... Absolutely credit for the no hitter here. How the, there was no other room for him to get and to, to no hit anybody else. They, they, the game was over and nobody got a hit. He pitched the entire game. What what, what what's the argument here? I, I really don't get it. Yeah, that's my thing. Is that you can't? I mean, I get what they're trying to do. Is like, oh, all other no hitters in history are nine inning no hitters. And this one's like he, Matt and Baumgartner got the short end of the stick by being the first one to do it in a seven inning game. So, like, the, he's the test case, I guess, for uh, the fans. But it should definitely be recognized as a no hitter. He went out, pitched the whole game, and didn't get a, get a hit. I would be okay if, like, they had, like, in the history books, the MLB history books, and they had all the no hitters. Like, there's people who threw a no hitter, no hitter, no hitter. And then you just put Baumgartner, and in parentheses, you put the number seven. So yeah. people know it was in a seven inning doubleheader. If they want to take that as an asterisk to it and say, all right, he didn't do it. Like his game is in the specials. The other games with nine innings. Okay. But he did throw a no hitter. He played, pitched the whole game. Didn't give up a hit. That's a no hitter. This is like what I said about the runner on second rule is that you play with the rules that are in front of you. How are the rest of the rules of baseball not – permitted to what the commissioner and what the league did. I mean, that that's that's where I'm at here. I mean, we could – I mean, I know you're not in tune as the baseball world See, as much I'm, as I'm I am. I'm looking at it objectively. Like, yeah. I'm not looking at it as like a baseball purist, as, a, as an absolute sabermetric nerd. Like, I'm not looking at it, I'm not looking at it like that. Uh, I'm looking at it like the guy went out there, nobody hit him, and he – Pitched a complete game. So that, that's, that's why, why I say that uh, he should be credited for another year. I totally agree with you. Funny uh, tidbit from that little doubleheader yesterday with the Braves and Diamondbacks is that they actually set the record for least amount of hits in a doubleheader. Yeah, one. One. That's crazy. They got Because Baumgartner threw a no-hitter in the second game, but the Braves got one hit in the earlier game in the previous record were two. I forgot the two teams, but in that uh, previous record, the team got no hit and got – 
two hit in the other doubleheader game. So rough, rough day for the Braves to say the least. So it's funny. Probably least. Yeah, it's a yeah. doubleheader. So why doesn't, probably be. Why doesn't a no hitter in a doubleheader with your MLB rules like no, no, no weather impacted the the shortness or, of, of the game? This was all predetermined by the MLB with one because the I mean if you just simple math the Braves would have had four more innings to get another or two more hits to break to, to not have that record. So now. They get they get left with least amount of hits in a doubleheader, but Madison Bumgarner, who is credited for not them for them not getting those hits, it isn't credited for his performance. It, it makes no sense to me. Yeah, it definitely should be addressed as a no hitter in history. Both of us agree with that. Um, I the in the people who don't, I feel like are the like super super old fans. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. They just, they're baseball traditionalists. Right. And that's not, yeah. And that's not why I'm. Sorry. And they'll always complain like, "Oh, he did it in easier circumstances." Yeah. But it, it should be no hitter. Uh, moving on, the Padres and Dodgers played their second season series of the season this past weekend, and oh my, are they electric? It's awesome. I mean, the actual the actual baseball rivalry to go get excited for, and they they're gonna play more this this season. So. I'm going to be tuning in. Like That's a game you mark on your calendar. Yeah, and this might upset some uh, also fans of older generation, but how this Padres-Dodgers rivalry with how young these teams are, how good they are, they could get close over the next 10 years to the Yankees-Red Sox rivalry. What are your thoughts on that, okay, being a Yankees so fan? As a Yankee fan, I would call almost call that sacrilegious, but it's all right. Uh, I'll, I'll go with your, your, your take for, for the time being. Um, I, I kind of agree with it to an extent because Yankees Red Sox really hasn't been anything with, aside from Joe Kelly, uh, hasn't really been anything with super bad blood since 04. So it, it really hasn't been the most exciting rivalry. Both teams haven't been dominant at the same time like the Padres and the Dodgers are. So that, I think for that reason that – Dodgers Padres can appeal to a new, not necessarily a generation, but a new demographic of baseball fans who are looking for an edge in, in, in the game. You know, they're, they're not looking for the same old nine hitting, I mean, nine inning two one game with just like pitchers you don't know, guys you don't know batting who are coming up from Double A, Triple A, whatever. These are legit playoff teams who both have a chance to win a World Series, and they're so, like you said, so young, have a ton of power in the bats. Um, I think it's great for baseball. Uh, as far as you know, all time ahead of Yankees Red Sox, I, I would I would pump the brakes. On yeah, that. I would I wouldn't go that far either. I'm just saying, like, in- if you even want to go the last two decades, I could say that in, 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 over the next decade, if everything holds true, I mean, all the star players stay in place, Padres Dodgers could could be better than Yankees Red Sox from 2000 to 2020. That, that's my like. I think the Padres Dodgers rivalry is now the best in baseball. The Yankees, Red Sox, they have the history, but when you talk about the current day, the the, the Padres, Dodgers, like they they hate each other now. Yeah, like they despise each other. It's fun. The game last night was one of the best games I've ever watched, objectively. Like not from a Mets fan perspective or anything like that. Objectively, the Padres, Dodgers game last night was an all timer. It was unbelievably good. Uh, Tatis, man. It's hard. It's funny to me. I laugh because when you watch um, ESPN broadcasts and A Rod's doing them, mm-hmm. I don't think there's someone who loves Fernando Tatis more than Alex Rodriguez. He loves him. Either way, though, five home runs in a series is ridiculous. Two off Bauer, two off Kershaw, and one last night. Where would you rank Tatis among players you'd want to start a franchise around right now? I okay. think he's in. And if I just quickly, I would name like my five after, but I think he's for sure in my top five. I think he's my top two. Ooh, I, I think it goes Trout and him. See, I'd take Acuna over him. Okay, okay, Acuna, Acuna kind of provides a similar um, skill set to Tat- than Tat- uh, to Tatis. Um, I just think Acuna's more. Um, he's been in the league longer, and okay. he's more. There's he's super young too. But you're right. Speedy, a flashy, one, t- home run power. Tatis is shortstop. Acuna's outfield. But I just think Acuna is 
a little bit more established. So I know what I'm getting in okay. with him more That's than Tati. And Tati struggles defensively. He actually leads the league in errors this season. Oh, really? He has nine already. Hmm. Interesting. Um, Tatis and, and Acuna are probably two, three, and you, like you said, you could probably interchange them. Even though Trout's getting like close to thirty, that's still ten more years. And he's Trout's gonna, gonna yeah. die with the, with the, the game for another decade. Um, the reason um, I, I have Tatis at two is not because I, I, I think he's a miles better, you know, baseball player than say Acuna, but I think he provides an element of the game that is. Badly needed for baseball. It's and it's excitement. I I think he brings a lot of excitement to the game when he's, you know, hitting home runs and, and slapping up all his teammates and, and getting the crowd pumped up. Like that's that's necessary for baseball. I, I'm not going to call it a dying sport, but it's a it's a sport that you know Americans aren't really super in tune with on a day to day basis. Like they're not excited to go watch the baseball game unless you know you're a baseball fan, obviously. So he brings an element that you know. Other pro sports, like basketball, football, those sports, those they're, they're athletes. They, they get excited when a big play happens. Baseball, a lot of the time, you, your guy hits a home run, he runs, he rounds the bases, and his teammates, like when he gets back to the dugout, is when is when the excitement comes. I want to see that on the field. I want to see the fans get you know rise to the occasion, lift their emotions with the guy with the home run, and and boo the pitcher, whatever whatever you got to do to make the game more exciting, more appealing to to the next generation of fans. That's why. I, He's with you. He gave up. I to, liked a lot of what he said. In yeah, conference. he gave. He's one of those pitchers who likes to celebrate. Oh, rub it in your face a little bit if he strikes you out. Yeah, yeah. But it's the same, same way. No, when you when, if a pitcher's having a nasty day and he strikes out the best player on the team, celebrate a little bit. You know, throw your fist in the air. It it, it, it just adds more to the game that that wasn't previously there. So, and it's good to see that he he obviously there's the saying, "Don't dish it if you can't take it." Right. And that's like the most like perfect saying in baseball because there's a lot of that going on is like they, they would love to get excited and like show their excitement how happy they are but if they do it to them then next thing you know they're hitting the next pit, uh, batter with a fastball but um it was good to see bauer like say yeah he should celebrate i would too like it's good for the game it grows the game so a lot of people don't like bauer but he is ultimately in the boat of Wanting to increase the love in baseball, and he's doing a good job of it. So. I agree. He's bringing he's bringing the game to social media. He, he, he... Hit at the next at bat. Um, I think that should be penalized. I, I do. I think I think like when you saw Syndergaard and 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 then you know that classic Mets episode. Oh, that was awesome. Uh, you know the best mic up. Yeah. If you haven't seen it, just go look up Mets mic up. You, you'll find it. All right. I don't know this. I forget the Terry Collins. Terry Collins, yeah. Terry Collins mic'd up. The best <laughs> mic'd up sports moment I think I've ever seen. I think it's hilarious. Everybody should see it. Um, so, in, in a situation like that, obviously, you know, Syndergaard did get thrown out, but it was for a different reason. It was because guys were sliding into second base. Uh, well, what the, yeah. Well, against the Dodgers, and the, what the Dodgers did to the Mets when they played in the postseason was a little too far. Okay. Well, I wouldn't say Dodgers. I don't know if you could recall. Chase Utley? Chase Utley, dirty slide into the shortstop, who was Ruben Tujada on a double play. Tujada broke his leg on the play. Yeah. Okay. So, I mean, it's not like it went back like, I hate you, I hate you, bench is uh, clear. Like, legitimately playoff baseball, dirty slide, broke someone's leg. Ended up pretty much ending his career because he never really got back to even like on the field with the Mets. So there you go. I mean, Chase Elliott's just going back. I'll stay right here. Um, but you know, that, that move is, is a little different. Now when a guy hits a batter after getting raked off of, that's a little different. I mean, like he got you, man. Like, why are you, why are you taking it out on him? Because you threw a meatball like that. That's, that's where I'm, that's where I'm at there. And I think pitchers should be penalized for something like that. I could I could see that. Uh, you see less and less of it now, but it still comes around sometimes. Like in the early of the season, like Wilson Contreras like got hit in the elbow and thought he was thrown at and started like jawing with the bru jawing with the Brewers, and it was like Wilson Contreras also stands an inch off the plate. Yeah, yeah he, so, uh, he, uh, he hugs the plate. So it's like why like if you're gonna hug the plate and they hit you on a fastball that would have not hit you if you just stand like a normal person, <laughs> like. Don't, you can't get mad and think people are throwing at you. Anyway, there's a lot of weird things that happen in baseball. It's like blows your mind sometimes. 
Um, sport. Yeah, <laughs> it is a weird sport. Uh, we're going to move on to some NBA talk now. Uh, this week in this league, there's – so, like, we have to go back to last week a little bit. But before we do that, we talked about the next win streak. The Wizards have – They're still the. They're still. They were so low before this. They're still the tenth seed in the East as of today. Would be in the play-in tournament. Do you buy the Wizards as a chance to make noise in the play-in tournament? And if they do end up getting one of those two spots from that tournament, do you buy them causing havoc for one of the top teams in the East? Okay, so I. Well, my honest opinion is I believe they do get one of the two seeds. I do. I think Charlotte's banged up with injuries. I think, you know, eventually Westbrook and Beal, like that's just too much talent to, to match up with Charlotte. If they get LaMelo and Gordon Hayward back, depending on the, their, their health, um, that could be a different story. But I don't, I don't think the Pacers are very good. What's interesting, what's interesting to me about the season, and I'm not going to talk about it really at all, but I'm just, just going to say why are the Raptors so bad. Uh, that, that's just something I've been, you know, fascinated by all season. Um, Wizards are going to win the play-in tournament because – the world needs Westbrook Durant in the playoffs. They need they, it. They, it could be a matchup situation. And don't be surprised if the Wizards take a game or two off, off, off the off the nets. That could the happens. competitiveness of that would be fantastic. Because Beal's a guy who can get hot. Flip side though, they almost play perfectly into the nets. They don't have someone who could dominate the paint. They don't play good defense. The nets would score on them at will. It would just be if the Wizards could keep up or not. Listen, I won't take any Robin, Robin Lopez slander, okay? <laughs> I, I, that guy's a horse. No, I'm kidding. But um, the Wizards, I mean, it, as far as the guard play goes, it, 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 it matches up with anybody in the entire league. Westbrook has really been playing, like, so under the radar really good this season. Um, I saw a stat today. He's averaged a triple-double over the last five seasons. I mean, uh, yeah, he's been on the real. It makes sense when like, you think about it. That's, that's like, just looking at it today. I was like, whoa. That's just like my problem with him. Like, he's like puts up insane stats, like record setting league history stats, but like, it, he never wins. Like, he had Harden and KD on his team. Like, he had. Then, when yeah. he did that, when he started padding the stats, he didn't have anybody on his team. But, except, for, I mean, his best, second best player was Victor Oladipo, who couldn't stay out. Maybe that Depot wasn't bad on the Thunder though. That one year, yeah, he wasn't. He wasn't great. That whole Thunder team. I mean, everybody made fun of that Thunder team all, all, all year because Westbrook had zero help. That, that, the, was, that, that you know that team had um. It's a bonus. Stephen Adams. Yep, Sabonis. Sabonis was trash. Victor was like, Depot. Sabonis was brutal as rookie. Season. Andre Roberson. Oh, Andre Roberson. I mean, where is he? Where did he go? I mean, we're all we're on He's at, He's actually on the Nets, I think. As a, like one of the bench <laughs> he pieces. You're so right. I'm, uh, he is not. Has he even played? No, no. No way. He hasn't played basketball in five years. You That's know who's crazy. the modern day Andre Roberson, but could actually make shots? Who's that? Oklahoma City Thunder, Lou Dort. Oh, well, I mean, Lou Dort. Is Lou a, Dort's like turning into one of my favorite like, players. Lou Dort is a modern day Kawhi Leonard. He, really Lou crazy. Dort's not on national television because the Thunder stay. Speaking of guys who stink and, and, and who are fun to watch, it, it, it's kind of crazy to me how, how weird, and this is a tangent we didn't really have here, but I did want to include it in the show. NBA guy, NBA players, I mean, the talent level is so high. I, I don't know if we talked about this. I, I think I was angry about it for a little bit but on, on, on last week's show, but it keeps happening. Role players keep dropping 40, and, and, I'm, and I'm really sick and tired of what's going on with the NBA. Like, they, they start, there's, there's 30 guys in the league who average 20. It, it, actually, there's way more than that. I, I lowballed the number. I think there's 45 guys in the league who average 20. I think there's 25 guys who average like 23 or more. It's ridiculous the scoring in this league. But uh, if I'm going to talk about this tangent real quick, Dwight Powell yes, uh, yesterday or the day before, whatever it was, when the Lakers played the Mavs, Anthony Davis and Andre Drummond both played. Both played substantial minutes as well. Dwight Powell, the big for the Mavericks, had – like I think was it thirty two or twenty eight on on ten or twelve shooting and nine boards. W where are these numbers coming from for some of these guys in the NBA? See, this just shows you for like the natural fan that calls people bad, like when they have a bad game. This just proves to you that quite literally any player on the court at any given time, any given day, could give you twenty five. Oh yeah. Oh yeah, and, and, and any given player at any given court, uh, on like the, like the Thunder, you know, their their average age is twenty. They would wipe any college basketball team by f like 50. fifty minimum. 
it, it takes so much skill to get to the NBA. It's absolutely unreal. And and I commend these guys, the role players who are who are dropping for him. I mean, Chris Boucher is the first guy who comes to mind this afternoon who's putting up like 40 and 20 some nights. Nice. Ennis Cantor's putting up 20 and 30. Uh, like where are all these stats coming from? It's really crazy to me. But at the same time, I do have to commend the talent level that the league has today. Talking about the Nets, they are on a six-game win streak that Monday. Well, here we are a week later, and they've won three and zero in that span, and they're on a nine-game winning streak right now. Tyler, in this past week, has anything changed yeah. in your belief regarding the next ceiling? Because oh. you won on a quick, and you you got pretty angry. I say maybe one of the most angry I've ever seen you on your show <laughs> last Monday talking about the Nets. Listen, the opinion has changed. Okay. The ceiling has not. They will not make it out of the first round. I promise you they will not make it out of the first round. So the ceiling hasn't changed. What's the opinion? They're good. They're, okay. they are, they're a good basketball team, and they play – They have. And I, and I told Tom last week, they have so much heart, and they play actual defense, and that's why I actually like the Knicks this year. But the second they go to flashy offense next year, ooh, wow, they will be my most hated team again. Um, but, no, this, team, this team's got a lot of heart. Uh, Tom Thibodeau, obviously the best hire, I think I said, in New York sports in the last 20 years. Um Really uh, great job he's done there. Julius Randle has obviously elevated his game to, to height that I would never expected him, even when he was highly touted out of Kentucky. I mean, top 10 pick in the draft in a fairly good draft in 2014. Um, nobody expected him to be putting up 40, although, I mean, like I just said, anybody could put up 40 in the NBA today. But Julius Randle's doing it at a pretty consistent clip. Uh, he's making threes. He's dribbling. He's distributing. He's doing a lot of things to this Knicks team that they didn't have last year, even when he was on the roster. So I commend Julius Randle. He's the lock for most improved player, even though that that award is so weird. I do think Julius Randle is going to get it. Um, the Knicks are the Knicks are really good, and then they they give everybody their best shot every night, and that's what that's what's really cool about them. They're they're young. They're not, they, especially their veterans don't need a ton of minutes. Um, these guys can play thirty five minutes a night. They're young guys and really give everybody in the NBA their best shot night in and night out. That's why they're winning games. And uh, I still don't think they'll uh, win a first-round playoff series, though. <laughs> okay, so after all after all the compliments I just gave them, they are not winning a first-round playoff okay, series. So I, I agree promise you. with everything you just said about the Knicks, especially when it comes to the playoffs, because the thing about the Knicks right now, they're top defensive team. And like you said, they try every given night – play 110 percent they're playing they're exactly like they shot. do now like they will in the first round and that's my thing when you play a other different team they might not the knicks i think are an exception that played that hard every night when teams get to the playoffs like and they're not going to match up with the heat in the first round because they're going to they stink anyway <laughs> but if you were to compare like the heat in the playoffs versus the knicks like now that's like it's a different Heat team than you would absolutely. You would be the same exact Knicks team. I agree, and I think I think that that goes uh, the same with the Celtics or, or or Milwaukee. I mean, Milwaukee after having the best record in the league last year, they they're slipping a little bit this year. I know the East got a little bit better, but I mean, even Philly, who's sitting at number two, they were number one for a while. They they don't really go out there and, and throw everything they have on the floor because right. there's injury concerns. I mean, the Knicks are so young and fresh, and these guys play all these minutes, and they're they're so. Their chemistry is so great that they can go out there and just play hard and and, and keep and keep doing what they're doing. These older established stars kind of have to, and I hate the word load load management. I hate the concept of load management, but they do have to. I mean, not necessarily even take nights off, but some nights like the, the gas isn't going to be as filled as as when you know the playoffs come around. So it, it, for for veterans of the league playing another uh, seventy two games in such a short stretch. I mean, like like I said. Knicks are so young. This is a short stretch. This is like a glorified AAU season for them. It, it really is. So it, it, it's going to be much different for a lot of these teams when it comes to the playoffs. But the Knicks are a team that I think is going to stay consistent until they're eliminated. And like I said, that will be in the first round. Now, let's move on to our next because the Heat and our, both my Heat, your Celtics, are tied for six in the East. Right? And they both stink. They do both stink. I, I think I they lost to the, uh, who they lose to on Friday. 
Oh, the Heat? Yeah, they lost to the Hawks without Trey Hung. Trey, well, Trey Hung, what the heck? Trey <laughs> Young, uh, Clint Capella. Like, they, oh, oh, they didn't. They didn't have everybody. Oh, they, all they had was Bogdan Bogdanovich. Oh, he went for thirty, right? And uh, Gallinari. Yeah. yeah, that's all they had. And the Heat lost. That's when I officially like gave up on the season. I was like, all right, this team sticks. There's no way they get Oh, oh, you gave up on the season too? Yeah. Oh, okay, me too. Sweet. All right, so I came up on the season yesterday when the Celtics beat the uh, loss to the Hornets and uh, everybody played. So, um, oh, except for Robert Williams, who I will admit provides a lot to the Celtics. He 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 gives a new dynamic angle to the Celtics that they don't have when he's not playing. But Tristan Thompson's been playing pretty good lately. Um, yeah, we lost to a Hornets team of uh, PJ Washington. Cody Martin, who I didn't think would make the NBA. Uh, Miles Bridges, who, surprising, he's good. and gets elevated by the announcers. Devontae Graham, who fell off a little bit after last year. And Terry Rozier, who will always give it 110 after, uh, to the Celtics for the rest of his career. So don't want, don't feel like playing him much longer. And uh, a bench consisting of Caleb Martin, his brother, who I also didn't think he was going to the NBA. Uh, they were a package. They were a package everywhere. Uh, Jalen McDaniels, who I really don't know anything about. Bismack Biyombo, who's been in the league for, I guess, where, however long, and he just does the same thing every time. Nick Richards out of Kentucky, who I really didn't think would be in the NBA. They had a lot of draft picks this year. Oh, and another former Celtic point guard, Brad Wanamaker, who just wants to toast us, I guess, because he, he stunk last Hornets, year. Though? Yeah, he got traded from the Warriors. Oh, no, he was released from the Warriors. He got picked up by the Hornets. I think yes. then Melo went down. Uh, no, I didn't know that happened until yesterday, so I, I still thought he was a Warrior. Uh, but, yeah, we lost to that team, and uh, I'm pretty sure the Magic could beat that team if they really tried. Uh, so... I've given up on the Celtics until I see a difference in the playoffs. It's it, it, I don't have any interest in watching the last 12 games of the regular season, uh, except for the last game against the Knicks, where, where, I'm, where I might be in attendance. So it'll be fun. Okay. Um, but either way, both our teams are tied for the sixth seed. It's like it will one of our will both of them. Oh. Get, avoid the playing tournament. No. No, I, I didn't think so. The Hawks in the uh, both the Hawks and the Knicks are two games ahead of the Celtics to beat. There's 11 games left. Is there a chance they uh, both our teams turn it around the last 11 games? I don't know. My thing is the Heat had a golden opportunity against the Hawks on Friday. If they won, they would have won the season series against the Hawks. They lost, so they don't have the tiebreaker against the Hawks. They do have the tiebreaker against the Knicks. The Knicks don't look like they're slowing down, even though they do have a tough schedule coming up. Hey, you guys beat the Bulls this weekend? Yeah, we played against tonight, too. Oh, I see. I did see that. Is anybody playing? Uh, Tyler Hero is not playing. Oh, yeah. And the Celtics also lost on um, when you on Friday, uh, like when the Heat lost yeah, to lost the. They lost three or four, correct? Oh, Celtics have lost three or four. Yeah, we stink. Yeah. Um, the we lost to Kyrie and friends. That that's that's all that happened there. You guys won six of seven and then lost. And then we were on a six game win streak. We were on we we won uh, nine of ten and then we have lost three or four since then. That's nah, not positive. Not I a, do think we had one of our teams ended up getting into the the seventh seed. And what will this well, ultimately determine that, in my mind, is uh, the Heat and Celtics play twice in the last half of the season. I was going to say. Well, you guys already won game one. So I think if the Celtics just split those two games, you guys will end up being the sixth seed, and he will be in the playing tournament. Yeah, I'm not holding my breath. I mean, although your team obviously doesn't have much going for him either, but, I mean, the Celtics, Jason Tatum needs to start acting like an alpha. Because yeah, back to back games, I mean, this was last week. I'm not even really talking about the the, the stat lines, really. I know, uh, but like back to back games with three for seventeen shooting was not great. Oh no no no! I mean, I'm not. I'm I'm beyond that at this point. When he's throwing lazy passes that are getting picked off by Terry Rozier in the backcourt, then there there's there's some questions that need to be answered about his motor. Um, and let make no mistake, Jason Tatum is my favorite player in the NBA. I think he's a dynamic scorer. I think he can be the number one option on a championship team at some point. But right now. He needs to be. He needs to be giving it his all. He gets. Re he's re actually resting tonight or or tomorrow, whenever we play uh, against the Thunder, and I believe it's tomorrow. Um, so hopefully we can come out with a win against the Misfits in Oklahoma City. But I'm not, again, I'm not holding my breath. I really have no expectations for the rest of the season uh, at all. We have actually the fourth easiest schedule remaining in the regular season, and we will probably go six and six to end the year. Lots of negativity going on. I have no nothing positive to say about them. They don't try. They don't. They have no heart. If, if the Celtics, if the Celtics have the Knicks' heart and, and camaraderie and, and and companionship, we would be the number one seed in, in the East. I, I I think that could be said about a lot of teams, though. I don't know if you saw this, Tyler, but in our uh, live stream chat, who's going? Who's your going? Buddy Reese 
Knicks could beat the Celtics in a seven. See, that's just that's outrageous because you know y- talent wins. It comes down to who's going to make more baskets. Who's going to who's going to score more at the in the in the end of the game is going to be Julius Randle, who's never played in a playoff game, or is it going to be Jason Tatum, who's been to two Eastern Conference Finals? Jalen Brown has been to three, and and Kemba Walker, uh, who's been to one as well. So we'll see. Don't know uh, how how credible that statement is, but Reese always likes to downplay the Celtics opportunities. Okay. Before we end the break and get into our second hour, which is basically all dedicated to our mock draft talk and NFL draft talk, we got to do our pick and rolls. Do. We always, I'm, we have I'm to. little, I'm struggling. I don't think I did that good last week. I'm not keeping track of my season record, but I don't think it's that good. I bet against Miami last week and they ended up like winning and covering. So Maybe yeah, I should start, start doing that. that. You know what I'm going to? The first step, the first one, Bulls plus five and a half. I do have some actual knowledge behind why I would take Bulls five and a half, though, plus five and a half. The Heat have played, um, I think, I think ten two-game series this year where like, they play the same team in back-to-back games with a night off mm-hmm. or in back-to-back days. They've only won both games once, which means out of the other eight times, they've split one and one. The Heat won the first game. So there you go. There's some knowledge. Bulls five and a half. Well, you're betting against the Heat again. Isn't that funny? Um, I will. Okay, so I'm looking. At, oh, my guy Robin Lopez is out. This is this this changes everything. Okay, no, I'm just kidding. Uh, Wizards, you said eight in a row. They're home dogs today against the Spurs. I would take them plus two and a half to cover against San Antonio. Robin Lopez out kind of scares me a little bit now. But uh, no, I'll, I'll take Wizards. Uh, I think they're 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 really trying to. That uh, even more the win tonight. So uh, I think at home, they're underdog. Well, why not? All right, my second pick: the Knicks. They've won nine in a row. They're they're not gonna make it double digits. So this, they, is a, this is you know what this this game tells me a lot. And I'm sorry to interrupt. This game is gonna tell me a lot. I'm gonna watch this game. It's on NBA TV. It starts in a half. Sounds are hot. Suns are good. Like they're good. Suns are hot. You th- are you still on that um, thought process that they're pretenders? I think they're championship pretenders. Um, I think they can make a Western Conference Finals run, though. So, but you don't think they could get to the finals? No, I, I, I need to, a year of Devin Booker losing in the playoffs. You know, classic redemption story. Okay. I, need that, I need that before uh, I get him just making a run in the finals. All right, because he's the best player on that team. So, oh, yeah, there's no doubt about it. I mean, Chris Paul obviously has the experience. He's only been to the Western Conference once, uh, Western Conference Finals one time, though, and then lost. Obviously, got hurt in game six uh, against the Warriors. I had the Rockets in that series. If Paul stayed healthy, though. Um, my second pick and roll of the night. Ooh, this is interesting. I'm actually going to go with Grizzlies going to Denver. Grizzlies are, are I've been playing a little. Uh, of late as well, ja, John Morant uh, pretty uh, elevating his game recently. Um, I'll take the Grizzlies plus four at Denver tonight. For some reason, the Nuggets are kind of slipping. Obviously, we saw Jamal Murray's out, but Nuggets are slipping a little bit. You guys see them turn around. Until then, I'm going to take Grizzlies plus four. Right. Sounds good. The Grizzlies coming off a weekend sweep of the Blazers, who have lost five in a row. Yeah, Blazers We're struggling. Fast. Struggling. All right, that's going to take us to break. When we come back, it's the hour that is dedicated to the NFL draft. So stay tuned. Listen to Director's Cut with Nick Roloff and Tyler Smith on WSBU 88.3, The Buzz.
back into the second hour of the director's cut with Nick Roloff and Tyler Smith on WSBU 88.3, The Buzz. It is mock draft time. Tyler and I will go pick for pick and each of our mock drafts heading into Thursday's first round. Like I said, it's like my favorite time of the year. It's a great time. Uh, it's thing, like This is a pretty good and entertaining draft, I think. It stinks that the top two picks are already made because we haven't actually gotten that in a while. There's always like doubts, like who's going one. Last year there wasn't any doubt it was Barrow, but I mean the first two picks are pretty much locked in. So our mock drafts basically start at three, but we could just talk about it real quick. It's basically going to be official. Trevor Lawrence to the Jaguars, Zach Wilson to the Jets. Yep. I assume you had the same thing as I, as much as anyone ever. I was struggling. I had Ian Book at number two, and I was like, uh, oh, maybe early yeah. late riser, late riser. <laughs> um, but. What do you think Lawrence can bring to the Jaguars, real quick? Instant, pro, instant production. He is. I've, I've said it before. I'll say it again. I think, he's, I think he's the most polarizing quarterback prospect I've seen since Andrew Luck. A lot of people have said that. I know it's kind of a casual take, but I, I really do think he's that. That he's been built number one quarterback in high school. So I, I really do think that this is instant offense for, for Jacksonville. It'll be the first time in, in, in Jaguars history where I really say, like, oh, wow, they have a quarterback. Well, you didn't think Blake Bortles was cool? Uh, listen, I'm not going not gonna to speculate on Blake Bortles. I've always been a Blake Bortles guy, but he, he's not, he was not Trevor Lawrence. All right, I buy everything you said about Trevor Lawrence. Uh, this, the second one is where it gets interesting because yeah. it's penciled in pretty much already that it's going to be Zach Wilson, the quarterback of BYU. Talk to me about your boy, Zach. Dis- disappointing, I say, because that's back-to-back years where my favorite quarterback gets drafted to an in-division rival. Uh, second shout-out of the, uh, the show, Jake Fromm got drafted to the Bills last year. That stunk. Now they've got Mr. Trubisky, which even is more salt in the water. Yeah, right. They just want to take all my b- favorite quarterbacks. I mean, Pats, uh, we'll imagine the Patriots. It all culminates in the Patriots getting Sam Howell next year. That's cool. Here because he's electric television. You got to watch him play against the Patriots two times a year now. It stinks. But either way, Chris Sims on PFF, he's probably the biggest uh, Zach Wilson guy ever. I don't even think it's PFF. I think it's on BC Sports. So I apologize for that. But he actually has compared him to he can make Aaron Rodgers slash Patrick Mahomes type throws, which I wouldn't go that aggressive. But he does have, to me, the best arm talent in the draft he can make almost any throw on the field the just biggest question is that he's kind of a one-year wonder borderline trubisky like yeah like trubisky people like forget like yeah he was a clear-cut number one quarterback in that class from draft analyst perspective like but he only had one full year of starting he showed promise they also stunk they were eight and seven oh yeah wasn't too bad he was solid though this year they were it's true, but they don't play anyone too tough. That's the, that's the question. They did end up losing. They lost to Coastal Carolina in that in that uh, crazy rescheduled game that was just out of nowhere. Yeah, but uh, they got weapons for him a little bit. They have this, another pick in the first round, twenty three. I think Zach Wilson. I don't know how much he's going to give you year one, but the potential is there. It's all about if the Jets can grow and get him to make leaps from his first to second year? That's that's the big question. And I, obviously, yeah, he has some shoulder concerns too, but that's uh, it, it, it seems like it's in the wayside by now. Um, yeah, Jets need to figure out a way to build an offensive talent. And Darnold always had the talent, and that's why I think he'll be successful in Carolina. If I just want to just move over to him real quick. But, um, yeah, the Jets are going to have to figure out how to develop the talent in the backfield, and they haven't done it in a long time. Uh, this, this is just – the perfect time for a uh, change of scenery. And one thing before we move on to three and we start really getting into our mock drafts, because that's basically where everything starts. I would say, though, if I was the GM of the Jets, which I Jets fans probably think are, are glad I'm not, I would have actually stuck with Darnold, traded back out of two, got an extra first round pick, moved to like me. Or like probably nine to like 14. And I would have just taken an offensive lineman. Did you were who? The Jets. Really? I would have moved back, grab an extra first-round pick. Because you think they already have the 23rd pick in this draft. 
So they would have had that. They would have gotten another first round pick just like in the mid teen range. And they would have got an extra one for next year's draft. And they would have been Arnold and roll with that. That's what I would have personally done if I was the Jets. And I like Zach Wilson a lot. I'm like, hi. So yeah. I don't that'd know. Be, that'd be interesting. If they obviously that, that that's all contingent on if they stay with Arnold, they didn't. So we know we know yeah. like, we know the outcome now. Yeah. All right, let's move on. The San Francisco 49ers, the biggest pick of the first round in all likelihood. They're picking three. Tyler, who do you got them taking? Which quarterback is it gonna be in your mock draft? The Mac Jones talk is all smoke. We're going Justin Fields to the Niners. I think it's just it's too easy. Not not too easy because obviously there's nothing going around right now that says that the that Justin Fields will be selected by the San Francisco. But right now, to me, he can do – he's more dynamic. Just – it has to be Justin Fields here. And people kind of talk about his frame. I mean, 6'3", 228, like there's nothing wrong with that as far as an NFL quarterback. As long as he has the ability to make that second read, he'll be down in the NFL. And I, and I haven't always been high on him, his ceiling as far as an NFL quarterback goes. Now, turn my turn my head a little bit. Listen, I said at the beginning that I believe that they should take Fields, that I thought they would take Lance. Analysts thought they would take Mac Jones. I have fully bought in to the 49ers taking Mac Jones. I have them. I have Mac Jones going third to San Francisco in my mock draft. Listen, I don't think he's better than Fields or Lance. I just legitimately think that the 49ers traded up to take Mac Jones. It, 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 I don't get it. Uh, there must be something. I mean, I am not a, a, a scout. I am not a GM. I'm not a coach. There has to be something I'm missing about Mac Jones. I mean. He just didn't impress me. It's like a, he, he has the best. Like we talk about ant, arm talent with Zach Wilson. Course, yeah. But when it comes to accuracy, Mac Jones is the most accurate deep ball thrower in the class. He runs a lot of good play action fakes and he yeah. did that a lot in college which is Shanahan's offense. People forget Shanahan's like number one quarterback like ever just joking but he did really want him in San Francisco is Kirk Cousins. Maybe if Mac Jones like can do what Kirk Cousins or, or what Shanahan wanted Kirk Cousins to do for his offense, that's why they traded up the 3 to get him and I I never really bought into that idea that they traded up to take Mac Jones, but I think over the past week and a half I have been Persuaded to in that direction. Well, you think that they are going to go with Mac Jones? I think it's all smoke and mirrors. Um, I, I don't know. I think that I think that Justin Fields can also do something for this offense that that Mac Jones really it, it, it's not his super specialty is you know, the short to medium ball, getting the ball out quick and in, in two seconds or less is is exactly what 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 that team needs as far as their wide receivers go. Brandon Ayuk and Debo Samuel are, are big run across the middle kind of guys, quick routes. Um, for that offense, because it, 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 what, what that offense boils down to is a run for a scheme. So we're going to have to see how it works out. I think Justin Fields is the best short to mid thrower in, in, in the draft. So that's why I have him, uh, them going with Fields. You have him going with Jones. Yeah, just one thing before we move on, though, by the 49ers. Like like you said, they got Ayuk and Debo Samuel and Kittle, three run-after-catch monsters. Yeah. So maybe their thought process – okay, let me draft the most accurate deep ball thrower here. We'll have him do quick throws to those guys. Let them make plays. Let the running game work. So we just need the quarterback with the most accurate deep ball to take shots, and we'll just allow him, him to get the quick throws out with everyone else. That could be a thought process there. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm just I'm worried about Mac Jones' reads as far as quick reads in the NFL. I mean, defenders are – SEC uh, secondaries and NFL secondaries are just miles, and I mean miles apart as far as I mean. But to be fair, though, SEC secondaries is the best secondaries you play in college. Absolutely, um, but I, I don't know. There's just something about it. Is that these these receivers in, in Alabama got open in space every single time, and and just when you want to talk about deep ball, he put it on the money, but. His receivers could track those balls so easily because they were so good as far as running down the field. That's fair. That's fair. They could catch everything that, that was thrown at them. They would get under it. If it was overthrown, they would get they would get under it if it was underthrown. So that's why I think that Mac Jones just I, – I don't get the hype. 
but we'll see. Yeah, I mean, you, you're saying you don't really get the hype either, but this is what you think of the night. Yeah, that's what I think they'll do. Well, I, I literally, like, like I said, and I agree with you, like, they should take Justin Fields. I don't, and there was a report like earlier that you said you do between Lance and Jones. I, I believe that report a thousand percent. Okay, so I don't believe that. Th- th- it comes down to whether you believe the smoke or not. So that's why I'm thinking that you know I said it before. NFL teams do things that nobody expects on draft night, and I think the Niners start that off real quick at number three in select field. Just w- w- sorry, one more thing <laughs> before we move on. Though I I buy it because I don't think there would be a reason for them to do a smoke screen. It's locked in Lawrence and Wilson one two. Who do they have to fool at three? You're right. That's my thing. So if that report comes out. They don't have to fool anyone because no one's going to – the Jaguars and Jets aren't going to take one of those three. So that's why I believe that's really between those two. Makes total sense. I absolutely agree. And you know what? We've talked about all the – well, I actually haven't talked much about Trey Lance yet, so we'll get to him when we get select him. But we've talked a lot about Mac Jones and Justin Fields. we got a different kind of player coming in at number four, I believe. And this one, uh, I'm, I'm sure without trades, like we said, we aren't doing trades for this mock draft. Sure, we kind of got the same guy here. What do you? Yeah, I I alluded to that this is my thought process last show when we talked about the draft. But I do have the Falcons saying Kyle Pitts okay, at four. Right. Um, it, it, what, if they say this trade is available if you give us the right package, that obviously means they do not love a quarterback at four and they're just willing to – to be taking in – or being hit with a ton of dead cap because his contract is so big, yeah. and then their thought, and then there's a thought process. Maybe they trade Julio to save money, and if they traded Julio, then they would need a weapon to go with Calvin Ridley. And I just the freak athlete. Many people believe Kyle Pitts is the best player in this draft outside of quarterback. I think he goes for. It. I uh, totally agree. Everything you just said, it, it, does, it goes without saying. Watch a little bit of Kyle Pitts tape; you'll understand. I called him months ago. I called him a Darren Waller clone. He's better than Darren Waller right now. Telling you that right, right now, now. Yo, oh, oh. That, that's an he's, that's he's an aggressive. Coming in, he's going to come into the NFL and, and have multiple 100, 100 yard games in his first five. I and promise you that. That's a, that's a bold take. It'd be interesting to see if they keep Julio, he would be the third option behind that, Calvin Ridley and Julio. I don't think that, well, and obviously we're not talking about trades here, but I don't think that the Falcons keep Julio if, if, if Pitts is the pick. I I seen a lot of things that people are. Do you really want to run that whole offense? That I mean, would be an electric offense. They're just their defense sticks. That's the only bad. Thing. Yeah, they score forty, but let up forty five. So. Yeah, exactly. and they, and they, it's and a they, cowboy they, situation. They've done. Hey, listen, the Falcons have also done that these past few years. Yeah. So. Okay, let's move on to Cincinnati at five. I believe you mentioned it pre-show. I think we got the same pick here. Yeah, Penny Sewell, yep. offensive lineman, Oregon. It's not a sure thing that this happens. I just believe that the Bengals will ultimately come to their senses because it's between Jamar Chase and Penny Sewell at five. It's basically what's been reported all along. Obviously, Chase has that connection with Burrow from their college days. I just think the Bengals, when they see they're on the clock, they have to realize if we want Burrow to be our quarterback for the next 10 years, we got to make sure he doesn't tear his ACL every year like he did last year. Hmm. And they draft the – I mean, Rashawn Slater's good, but the far and above best offensive lineman in the class. Yeah. Uh, well, I, I think it's close to what people think. I really do. And I'll get to that uh, in, in a few more picks here. But Penny Sewell, he's been billed as the best offensive lineman. He's been billed as a for sure left tackle. I mean, people talk about him like they talked about Quentin Nelson uh, a couple of years ago. So I, I think that he's a for sure pick. And if you don't want – Joe, uh, Joe Burrow's scar getting targeted by defensive linemen, then, you know, you, you take an offensive lineman here. And you, you, you put aside the Joe Burrow-Jamar Chase relationship for five minutes and you you think about the next decade that you're going to be playing with, with Joe Burrow and you take Penny so well. Yep, couldn't agree more. All right, moving on to the pick six. Miami from the Eagles. Yeah, they moved back because they were originally at three. Yep. and moved back in a series of trades. We broke that down about what it happened about a month ago. Miami at six. It's clear that they're going to take an offensive weapon because they need to to help out Tua. The question is which one. I think we have the same one. But, Tyler, who who in, is going six in your mock draft? He's not my biggest wide receiver on the board, but he's everybody's biggest receiver on the board. It's Jamar Chase. It's, it's not even close. And there, there's there's thoughts that maybe you take the, the – the take, take, Oh my gosh, I'm crazy today. You take the Tua 
teammate from Alabama and Jalen Waddle and put him uh, next to him in Miami. But I think Jamar Chase's skill set is just way too advanced not to take him. I mean, the Belinko off winner, hopefully I said that right, in 2019, he obviously opted out of last season. 2,000 yards, 18 touchdowns, his sophomore season, took a year off. He's going to have fresh legs. He's clear-cut the best wide receiver if you disregard Kyle Pitts being in there in that uh, that situation. It's a home run, and that offense will be, if Tua can deliver it, that offense will be top in the league. Think about this. If they draft Chase, which, like, it's common knowledge where if he's there, they probably will. Jamar Chase – Will Fuller, Devontae Parker, Mike Isaki. Mike Isaki's a solid tight end. I mean, exactly. He's no that, slouch. You say that name, but it doesn't, it doesn't shake. I mean, it doesn't raise a lot of eyebrows, but Mike Isaki's a solid tight end in this league. And when you have to pay so much attention to those other three wide receivers, if they draft Chase, Gusecki's going to have a good year. He's yep. going to slide in there and make plays. Absolutely. And and if and I'll, and I'll throw out something right here. If the Bengals do take so well, this pick will be in within – 20 seconds when the Dolphins Now, the, the craziest thing, um, situation. We have no trades. We're going to throw in a hypothetical right okay, here. hypothetical show. Right, exactly. We love it. Someone jumps up to four, four drafts wow. a quarterback. Bingo with Seoul. Miami, yeah. Chaser Pitts. Oh, you have to go Pitts. Yeah, it's, it's a really, question. That's a real question. I, I will, uh, you know, you don't have to, obviously. It's to each their own. And then you ask Tua what he wants in that situation. I think – it's it's interesting because was Tua the quarterback when OJ Howard had the big game, or is it? Mm. I think OJ Howard's been in the league for four or five years. It was not Tua. Okay, so no, it was not Tua. It was that it was that one guy in between. Um, it might have been Jalen Hurts. It was. It might have been Jalen Hurts, but it might have been that one dude before. I always forget the the Alabama quarterback's name before him. Um, I, I I don't have my finger on it now, but um, you got. I think you kind of have to ask Tua because they're not they're not looking they're not in the quarterback department. They don't really have any competition for him. So at that point, like I said with Lamar before, like I said with Russ before, I know he hasn't didn't have a crazy rookie season, but you have to ask your franchise guy, like, oh, would you rather have Jamar Chase or Kyle Pitts? Because we both don't we both think that they're very valuable picks here. Which would you rather prefer? And then they go with that. Yeah, it'd be interesting. The offensive coordinator, I don't know who it is, to be honest, off the top of my head, but that person would have an interesting time having to decide whether they want to scheme up for Kyle Pitts or scheme up for Jamar Chase. Yeah, I mean, that, 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 that's another guy who we should eat, uh, obviously be in the draft war room and he'll have a, a hand in who they select. Oh, yeah, he'll, he'll be there for sure. Uh, let's move on to Detroit with seven. I think the fir- first six, you kind of had an idea where everything's going. I think seven could be the first pick where things start to move awry. Mm. I think it's going to – it's locked into something. You mentioned that you think they're doing something different than what I said. Yeah. What I want to hear what you got. What do you have Detroit doing in your mock draft? So with Sewell at the board, and, and obviously you say that, that Detroit needs weapons bad, and they do. Um, TJ Hawkins is still in town. I mean, he's, he's still there. So I, I don't think that getting the ball out of Jared Goff's hands is, is the biggest priority here uh, as far as to somebody. I believe that they have to protect them. They're, when's the last time you've seen like an actual good offensive lineman in Detroit? Yeah, I, could, I couldn't tell you. I mean, TJ Lang, after he was, you know, 10 seasons with the Packers, that's the last time I even even knew a, a, an offensive lineman's name uh, in, in Detroit. So that's something really interesting to see. And then they have a decent center um, uh, on their team. But you got to have guys on the outside that are going to protect Jared Goff. And that's why I will take Rashawn Slater here for Detroit. And, uh, you know, people talk about Penny Sewell as, like, the end-all, be-all of the offensive line. But – Slater could easily be, uh, you know, graded ahead of him in, by many boards, uh, actually. And you know, left tackles that, you know, you could change your franchise, you don't just fall out of a tree. So I'm thinking here that you have to you have to shore up the offensive line before you address weapons because whether or not um, Detroit takes a wide receiver here, they're still going to stink next year. They're still going to be in the running for a top five pick next year. I think you. I think you shore up the offensive lineman when it's when it's presented in front of you, and you go from there. I see that, but I have a different approach. I said they need weapons. They lost Kenny Galladay. They lost Marvin Jones. They do have T.J. Hawkinson, but do you really want your number one wide receiver being Quentin Stephus and Danny Amendola if he's still even on the team? I have no clue. Are you, are you really slandering Danny Amendola right now? I, I don't even know. I don't like, I, I don't know. They have to take a weapon because. 
you can't have Jalen Wall or well, there's my pick, Jalen oh, Waddle. Wow. But you can't have Jaron Goff throwing the ball to Quentin Cephas and TJ Hawkinson. Get Jalen Waddle. I should Devontae Smith's gonna be better, in my opinion, but you'd be Devontae Smith is my wide receiver too in the class, but everyone loves speed and Jalen Waddle's gonna go ahead of him. So I think the Lions take Waddle, get Jared Goff a weapon. And they they're gonna have an extra first round pick next year, and they're gonna use it to build their team. But a wide receiver one is a good start. Absolutely, I, I agree. Um, but I mean, I don't know. He's had injury concerns, but Tyrell Williams is is, is on the Lions now. Rashad Perriman on the on the Lions now. Uh, DeAndre Swift, Jamal Williams, who can uh, affect the game out of the pass, uh, is, is is also in Detroit as well. So I'm th- I'm feeling good about my pick for for Slater there. But you know. You can't go wrong with wide receiver because obviously, like you said, can't be thrown to those guys you know, for an entire year and yeah, expect any success. My question is, and if Jalen Waddle doesn't get drafted seven, Devontae Smith and Jalen Waddle gonna go? I think it comes down to preference by teams who want a wide receiver because think, teams really coming up next don't really need wide receivers. No. Well, 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 there's one team that does. We'll get but. to that team uh, in a few picks, but we'll move on to number eight, and this is be Carolina. A popular bidding out spot, and there's been some rumblings about who might move up into that spot. There's a bunch of teams in, in contention, like you said, the ones you mentioned before, uh, football team, Steelers, Patriots, and what was the last one you said? The Steelers. Uh, I said Steelers, Patriots, football team. Oh, you said Steelers? Sorry, uh, Bears. Bears. Okay. So, I mean, we'll see. We'll see what happens with, the, with those uh, perennial playoff squads. But number eight, if Carolina stays put, who do you got? I got them taking the person you just had to, at seven, Rashawn Slater. Um, they just spent a lot of assets or a lot of picks to go get Darnold. I think they protect him. They have DJ Moore. They have Robbie Anderson, Christian McCaffrey. They have weapons. Their defense is young, but getting better. Jeremy Chin last year in the second round is a good help and a good building block on that defense with Brian Burns and company. Rashawn Slater, protect Darnold. And he'll, Darnold will have the best weapons in his career. You pick, you pick Slater, and he'll have the best offensive line in his career. And you go all in and hope Sam Darnold's the guy. If I honestly don't know where they would go if they keep this pick, me, but I think if they were to keep the pick, they go Slater. Okay, so I don't have either of those two guys you just mentioned, Slater. Oh, I've said Slater last pick, but I actually have Carolina taking Patrick Sertain here. Oh, it's interesting because I don't see them. Their secondary is not very good. I agree with you, but if they were to go defense here, I think they would take Michael Parsons. Okay. Uh, their linebacking core is actually the best part of their team, in my opinion. They have Denzel Perriman, Shaq Thompson playing the box at some points. So they, they their their um, linebacking core is not bad at all. Uh, obviously, they have Hassan, Hassan Reddick, who's playing D line now. I mean, he's lined up a middle linebacker for a large part of his career. They just picked Derek Brown last year. Um, Dante Jackson they added uh, in the secondary, but then A.J. Bouye, who they added as well, suspended. So And his, and his game has been de- depreciating ever since he left Jacksonville. So I really think the cornerback's a need here. I also think that Patrick Sertain is, is, is a solid guy who he's, – he's also one of those guys who's established. I think he's going to – you know you're getting with him once you, once you get into the uh, NFL. I think he won't be – Necessarily a number one top ten quarterback and cornerback in the league, but he's a guy who's going to start your games, he's going to break up passes, and he's going to make other other wide receivers' days, you know, not as great. So I really think that this would change the pick for Carolina. All right, I, that would surprise me. Like that'd be the first pick in the draft if that happened. Like for me to go, wow, I'm surprised they did that. It really would surprise me. Mo- moving on to Denver at nine, interesting spot here. They could go multiple ways. I have them taking Trey Lance. Okay. I think they're not satisfied with what Drew Locke has been giving them. Well, they already said that they want Drew Locke to have competition once the Exactly. In my mock draft, you had true to Justin Fields going earlier. Lance and Fields are both here at nine. I don't think that happens realistically with trade-ups. But with them both being here, I th- I'm pretty sure that it's been said that they prefer Lance out of the other three quarterbacks out of the top two. Mm-hmm. So I think they bring them in, create competition, and whoever ends up winning that competition, they trade the other one. So they have weapons. Their defense with Von Miller coming back is still going to be average. They really might be a quarterback away from being a 
I wouldn't say a winning, like a big winning team, but they'll a quarterback away from being very competitive in the AFC. I mean, their weapons are really, really solid as far as young guys go. Judy Sutton and KJ Hamler, who, who yeah. really came along in the second half of last season. He's been playing really good. Um, the Broncos, like you just said, quarterback away. And I thought they were quarterback away last year from being solid contenders in that division. I mean, outside of the Chiefs, you don't know what you're getting with the Chargers year in and year out. Uh, the Raiders, same thing. And then Broncos, obviously, they've, they've always had the established defense in that division. They just can't find it on offense. And uh, they're going to need to take a quarterback here. I actually think it's funny. I think Denver is a team I can see moving into, like, number four spot. If, you know, things got hairy as far as when, you know, teams hear about quarterbacks being taken. Because there's chatter going around around draft night. Like, NFL teams know what the deal is. As far as, you know, different players selected, the NFL draft is a big deal. And, you know, teams are so meticulous when it comes to these picks. I do think that they go quarterback. And, ugh, I, I have to switch in. I'm, I have the two quarterbacks in two spots. I'm going to agree with you. I do think they go Lance. I just – I was uh, I was only had them picking Mac Jones because I think that Denver does not know how to pick uh, quarterbacks. I think they picked the wrong guy in Mac Jones as far as what they need in Denver. But I think Trey Lance is going to be picking. All right. And we're going to go to quick break after our 10th pick to round up the top 10. You had Sertan going eight. Yep. The Cowboys desperately need secondary help. Sertan's top corner. To me, that's a no. no top corner in the class out of Alabama. I think they go with the other cornerback that is out of South Carolina, another SEC uh, uh, guy, obviously, Jason Horn. Uh, it, it, he, won't, he won't be, you know, the flashiest guy uh, selected, but Cowboys fans, they're going to see cornerback. They're going to see guy who had a lot of success against SEC quarterbacks. Um, I think this guy's going to be a really solid pro, and he's just going to be the next guy that, that, that needs to be stepping up for a, a Dallas defense that lets up, like you said, four, 40 points a game. Yeah, I don't think uh, it's any secret that the Cowboys are going to draft a corner at 10. It's just a question of which one. In I think Sertan's going to be there. You do not. So that I, I agree with that. In your mock draft, in your situation, that's the correct pick. Oh, yeah, absolutely. I, I think that they have to go secondary no matter what. Yeah. Um, anyway, we're going to have the break. When we come back, we'll have the last about 25 minutes, uh, no breaks, and we'll finish our first-round mock draft. So stay tuned. You're listening to Director's Cup with Nick Rolf and Ty Smith on WSBU 88.3, The Buzz. WSPU 88.3, The Buzz. You're listening to the director's call of Nick Roloff and Tyler Smith. In the last 25 minutes, planned out perfectly, we will have the last 22 picks in the NFL draft. So we're going to have to move a little quick. I think we can get it done. Anyway, coming back, the Giants at 11. This is who we're starting with. We just had a little discussion. We have the same pick, or did you switch? I forget. I switch up. Okay, he switched. So I, I, I do think before we before we move on, um, the, both the guys that we're talking about are either going to go here or the next pick. So I, I, I unless you have something different, but I, I think I mean both these. Guys. Yeah. So this is where it gets tricky because we both went our separate ways here. 
I have Devontae Smith going 11. Uh, the Giants add the 2020 Heisman winner to their offense, go all in with Daniel Jones, uh, pair him up with Kenny Galladay, Sterling Shepard, and Saquon Barkley. Hopefully with their top defense coming back, they will have an offense to go with it. If Daniel Jones isn't this isn't the guy, this pick will mean nothing. But well, they're thinking it will be. So I mean, I the big blue. They believe in Danny Jones, Danny Dimes, and uh, I, I also believe that they're taking Alabama wide receiver here. But I do think it will be the speedster, Jalen Waddle. Um, he fell a little bit farther in my mock than Nick's. Um, but you know, like I, like I said before, it's going to be preference when it comes to the Alabama wide receivers. And I think the Giants. They have Galladay. They have. Um, Shepard, guys with big catch radiuses and, you know, more possession receivers. Kenny Galladay, a deep threat for sure. Sterling Shepard, more of a possession outside of the, the numbers kind of guy. And Jalen Waddle is going to be that speed threat that, that the Giants have been missing for the past few years. So I, I think that's going to be the pick there. And with that, we move right into uh, a division rival of theirs, the Eagles, who moved to number 12, back from number 6. Nick, where are you going for Philly? This is an interesting pick. They could go wide receiver, but no team has drafted wide receivers in the first round in back-to-back years in over 15 years. I also have the big three gone already, so I don't think a wide receiver play here. There is a quarterback still on the board. Mm -hmm. For me, Justin Fields is still there based on my mock draft, but I think they stay with Jalen Hurts. And I think they sure up the secondary and they draft J.C. Horn to pair up with Darius Slay. Because they they got to stop the electric offense of the Cowboys. What the Giants are going to bring put if, if this remains true and the Giants draft Devontae Smith, they'll need a secondary to stop the, uh, Kenny Galladay and Devontae Smith. I think J.C. Horn would be the correct play here. They could go quarterback, but that to me is wasting last year's second-round pick or wasting this year's pick to whoever they start this year, I think the play here is corner. Well, you know, and then that, that, that makes total sense. And, you know, one thing I will say is that the Eagles have not made not made sense. Well, they've struggled drafting in the first round. As far as drafting the first round these past uh, few years. But I think that they see the Heisman winner still on the board, and they're like, okay, we kind of have to take this guy. And that's why I have Devontae Smith dropping to number 12. Like you said, um, no team has picked wide receivers back to back in the first round. Uh, what would you say ever? No, or last fifteen years. The last fifteen years. Well, the Eagles are, are absolutely the team to be to break that uh, streak. So they're going to do that here in my theoretical mock draft. Uh, yeah, they go with Devonta Smith, the Heisman Trophy winner. Number thirteen would be the Chargers. This where it gets interesting. Justin Herbert's going to need some help. I with where is the question? They the what I think the weapons they have with Eckler, Keenan Allen, Mike Williams, it's good enough. I think they make they sign Corey Lindsley to help protect Justin Herbert. I think they go the extra mile to make sure their future and their franchise quarterback is well protected for the best of their abilities. And they draft the third offensive lineman off the board, Christian Derisaw, the offensive tackle out of Virginia Tech. Keep Justin Herbert upright and they'll have a chance to win any game. I agree with that. Uh, I think I'm going with the same guy here, Christian Darasaw, Virginia Tech. Um, Virginia Tech was one of the least sacked teams in the ACC. This guy was the spearheading uh, that offensive line. So I really think that this is the pick here for, uh, for for LA as well. It just seems like you need to get Justin Herbert, like like Joe Burrow, uh, some much needed offensive line help. Yep. Uh, not much explaining needed to be done there. Moving on to 14 with Minnesota. They have weapons. They have the quarterback. They have the running back. Their defense is a little weak. Their offensive line is terrible. Where do you have them going? So I here I have uh, the Vikings. You know, they like you just said they need they have a lot of needs, and this is a guy who can fill a lot of those needs. Uh, obviously, on the defensive end is where I'm going here. I have them taking Michael Parsons and out of Penn State, and I think he can provide a lot. Their, their linebackers outside of Eric Hendricks, as, as long as he's healthy, uh, they're they're not great. Um, Anthony Barr, obviously still there, but I think that they're really going to shore up the front seven because Michael Parsons could play on the edge. He can play um, in the middle, and he can play like a Sam linebacker or something like that as well. Uh, I really think my, Michael Parsons is going to be the head here because you, you can put him in so many different positions on the defense, and the Vikings need somebody who like, like that who can roam the field. 
I get that, but I think they prioritize uh, the offensive line, back-to-back linemen I have in my mock draft because they have two such good weapons with Delvin Cook, Justin Jefferson, Adam Thielen. They need to make sure Cousins can get them the ball. I think their defense comes back healthy, a little bit better, so I think they make sure they get in good offensive linemen. They take the best interior offensive lineman in the draft. Elijah Vera Tucker at USC I think would help sure up their protection. That's why I'd go with them. Yeah, makes sense. I mean, another guy, obviously, they need offensive line help pretty badly. Um, I do think defense is something that you can really build on. Like that, that, That's going to be able to alleviate some of the pressure off the offense. They added Patrick Peterson this year. Um, and other couple of their pieces. Obviously, you don't know what's going to happen with Daniel Hunter, so that's something that, that that's going to be need to address as well. Um, they lost Everton Griffin last year, so the defense obviously needs some work. But um, they, they they they've added a little bit of help. Obviously, offensive line is a, a valuable position for them to go in as well. Uh, Fifteen, my Patriots. I, I assume we have I the. I I listen. I want to explain this because I'm doing it too. I mean, I'm not. I'm not going to say I'm not. I'm not doing it as well, but I already know you have Mac Jones at 15 yeah. in New England because yeah. it just my basic math. There is a quarterback left out of the top five, quarterback left for me in the top five. Does my quarterback's Justin Fields? I don't think he falls this far. I want to preface this. People say there's a chance it happens. There's a chance in the top ten. Just I, but in a no trade mock draft, when you look after pick three. The Falcons, I don't think, takes a quarterback. Bengals, obviously not. Dolphins, no. Lions with Goff, no. Panthers with Darnold, no. I had the Broncos taking Trey Lance, so they draft there. Cowboys, no. Giants, no. Eagles, I didn't think. It's logical that that fifth quarterback could fall to 15 with no draft trade-ups. So just my quarterback, based on the other teams, that uh, I think Fields is the one to fall. I don't think he does with the trades, but I think if in this situation, the Patriots would gladly take Justin Fields with the 15th pick. Yeah, uh, I, I mean, obviously, I think, they, I think they'd be glad that any of the quarterbacks could fall to the 15th, not to give up any draft cap. I agree there. So that would be an ideal situation for New England, uh, a mock draft with no trades. It's exactly what Bill Belichick wants to happen. It won't, <laughs> but we'll see. Uh, obviously, the team that can easily move up to the top 10. 100%. Uh, moving on to 16 in Arizona. This is where I thought about having Micah Parsons land, but they drafted Isaiah Simmons last yeah, very year. Similar exactly. So that's why I didn't think that. I have them who want, once thought as the best corner in this class, then after some pro days injury concern, I have the Cardinals taking Caleb Farley. Their mm-hmm. secondary is terrible. And if they want to compete with the signing of, or bringing in J.J. Watt in the third year, Kyler Murray, DeAndre Hopkins, second year in the team, I think they draft, draft Caleb Farley and attempt to make a run in the postseason. Yeah, uh, I actually have him going secondary as well. Um, Caleb Farley, obviously, if, if no injuries happened, um, I think he'd be the number one quarterback off the board. But uh, I have him going Greg Newsom here at a Northwestern. In the Big 12 and the Big 10, obviously, uh, excuse me, um, short in season, he only allowed 12 catches on 34 targets, 93 yards. That's ridiculous. And, I mean, obviously he didn't play that many snaps because of Big Ten's shortened schedule, but this is a guy you can you can put him in slot, you can put him on the outside, and that's where I think uh, Arizona needs to, uh, has the biggest need is that they need a guy who can play anywhere on the, in the secondary. Right now they have Malcolm Butler and Robert Alford, two guys who, I mean, they've had, they've had well, maybe one or two good seasons in their career, and it's been pretty downhill since then. Um, so I really think they need to address the secondary, and Greg Newsom's my guy. Greg Newsom, I have him going in a little bit, but uh, it's pretty high for Newsom. I'm not going to lie. Um, moving on to 17 with Las Vegas. This is interesting, but this is where I have Micah Parsons landing. Hmm. I think that'd be fun. I mean, that'd be a great pick for the Raiders. Say, if it you would. Have good. I I think Micah Parsons is seriously the best defensive player in the draft. It's just with team needs, and I just think there's so many offensive players going to be picked, and then the teams that do need defense in the top 15, top 16, need like secondary help so bad. It's just going to be an unfortunate slide for Micah Parsons to the Raiders. It would be a great fit. So I, I hope it happens for Raiders fans. Yeah, that'd be fun. Um the Raiders also are another team who can go in a lot of different directions when it comes to the draft time. I think it could be defense. I think it could be 
offensive line. Um, but here, I think that the Cleveland Farrell experiment is not the biggest um, win for the Raiders. And I don't think that they did the best job uh, with that pick. So for here, uh, I think I'm going to go to another Alabama player, a guy who's been quietly slipping down draft boards, but I don't really know why. I, I think he's one of the best defensive guys in the draft is, is Christian Barmore. And he was inconsistent a little bit this year at Alabama, but I mean, he was one of the best defensive tackles in the country. He was, there was zero pressures uh, as far as what he had. I, I think he's the best defensive line at Alabama, or defensive line prospects from Alabama since Quentin Williams. Um, you, should, you should have seen this guy in the college football playoff. He was absolutely eating up uh, Justin Fields. And, and you know, it, it was ridiculous what this guy was doing. I, I, I think he's a perfect pick here. Interior defensive line is not where uh, the Raiders is one of their strong suits, and I think that's where they uh, they stop here. Yeah, interesting. I actually have Barmore sliding, and uh, we'll get to that, I guess, in a while. But 18th, Miami with their second pick in the first round. They need – so they address wide receiver, and their offense should be set here. I think it's too early to take a running back, which they could take. I think they target a running back day two, day three. So the Dolphins need help defensively. They need to get after the passer a little bit. I think they take the first edge rusher in the class – which is a little bit of an aggressive play here, but the person with the most upside is Jalen Phillips out of my Michigan, excuse me. Um, He's super physical. He's like 6'4", 270. Like, that's ridiculous. And he also has one of the best three-cone drills uh, that I've ever seen. And uh, he said, he, you watch this guy at the Combine, he was absolutely just a freak of nature. I mean, obviously, there has, there's more that goes into it. Um, obviously, as far as technique goes, but this guy's a physical freak. That you can stick pretty much anywhere, and that's where I, I think we're going at number 18. Yeah, I could see that happening for sure. Moving on to Washington at 19, obviously a trade-up candidate. Uh, but sticking here at 19, I don't think they draft a wide receiver, which could be a need to fill out with uh, uh, Terry uh, McLaurin. McLaurin. I was having a brain fart there. And uh, Curtis Samuel. So I think they go linebacker because their linebacking core is probably the worst aspect of their defense. So they fill it out with Jeremiah Owusu Kamaro. I hopefully said that right. The linebacker out of Notre Dame. I think the clear cut second best linebacker in the class, just ahead of Xavier Collins out of Tulsa. And this is a slam dunk pick in 19. Yeah, I, I don't want to pick at all. Um, I'm going to hear, I'm going to go tackle, though. I really think that they, they're, they're going to need to protect any quarterback that runs through that door um, right now is Ryan Fitzpatrick. And, you know, they're going to be looking for uh, a quarterback. The, one of the different kind of guys who are, aren't going as far at, at, uh, super high on boards as far as uh, offensive tackle goes, but he's, he's older. He's a veteran guy. Uh, I really I think this would be the pick there for, for Washington. Fair. Moving on to 20 with Chicago, another trade-up candidate. I have them taking your boy. I think they grab a weapon outside of uh, Allen Robinson. It didn't go so well with uh, – oh, I'm really blank. Oh, Darnell Mooney. Mm -hmm. I mean, he was solid, but I think they want to get Andy Dalton. Oh, that stinks. But Andy <laughs> Dalton, really all the help he needs. that were still here like I think they would have been too much of a reach so I think they grab Bateman probably a secondary position of need but one that they could use and Bateman who's I think the clear-cut fourth best wide receiver in this class so I do actually it's funny that you have Bateman going higher than in your in, in your mock uh, I actually do have Farley dropping two tier uh, for the Bears they lose Kyle Fuller um, and you know the Cornerbacks a need for them. Uh, safety, they're actually really good at. They have to Sean, uh, Sean Gibson, Deion Bush, Eddie Jackson, obviously. Um, but <clears throat> cornerbacks a position of need for them. And while they do have uh, Allen Robinson and, and wide receiver number two, could be a serious um, path for them to go on this pick. I think Anthony Miller and Darnell Moody will, will be there enough. Probably really in Jamal Wims, two young guys who are also still there. And they got 
guys like Marquis Goodwin, Goodwin are also on the roster as well. And Cole Komet, another uh, viable tight end uh, weapon for Andy Dalton as well. So the Bears uh, go secondary here at 19. All right, with 21st, the Colts are on the clock. And I think they go defensive line, and I believe that they will go with the second-best edge rusher in the class. I think that's Aziz Ojuri out of Georgia. Mm -hmm. He shot up draft boards a little late. He wasn't projected to be a first-round pick until after the collegiate season. So the measurements are there. The athleticism is there. And the Colts, we know they love taking players that they think they can develop in the studs instead of in more or less the polished product. Aziz Ojuri, I think, would help them out pretty pretty well. So here, um, obviously, offensive line is something they, they could address. Um, tackle is, is somewhere that, I mean, Anthony Stanzo is, is not in town anymore. So that could be somewhere that they look uh, at, at pick 21. But here is where I have Bateman falling. And I think it could be a real, real upside pick as far as, I mean, if you put Rashad Bateman with a guy who can't throw the football, then you know you're not going to have much production from him. Carson Wentz has proven he can throw the football. Last year and the year before that, listen, he's had horrendous, and I mean horrendous, supporting casts. The coaching staff has not been in tune with him either. Now he's with Frank Reich, a guy who made him into an MVP. And you pair uh, Rashad Bateman as a potential number one. I mean, is as Ty Hilton gets any older and Michael. Uh, you know, kind of rises. That could be your number one and two uh, with with Hilton with the slot and Paris Campbell sliding down the depth chart a little bit. I think Carson West needs a for sure target uh, as a wide receiver. And I think Bateman's a pick here. I I can see that, but I just think uh, they believe in Michael Pittman that much. That's what I've heard at least from mm -hmm. like that the Colts really like Pittman. I I think I think T.Y. Hilton's day their number. That's the thing. that I I do buy that though. Um, the Titans, the division rival, picking 22. Yep. You had Greg Newsom going 20. Uh, Arizona. Okay, and you had Farley going 20. Yep. I have Newsom going to the Titans. Their secondary stinks. Malcolm Butler is gone. Well, I mean, he didn't really do a lot anyway, but he is gone from the team. Uh, they need to fill that. They uh, brought in Desmond King through trade. I think they need a third corner, and I think Newsom slides in and is able to produce for them year one. Yeah, Tennessee's a, uh, an interesting team here. They have a lot where they could go, but they're not also like – a lot of positions aren't – that's something that they could not do last year. They lose to David Clowney. I mean, he couldn't really rush the pass last year, but – at least he was a name. Um, right here, I'm going to go with your boy uh, out of Georgia. I really can't pronounce his name. Uh, Aziz Oljolari. Sounds sounds good. Right, Probably sounds, did better than me. Sounds good to me. Uh, just guy's a freak. He's super um, super young, super fresh, and Tennessee uh, will have a lot of room to develop him. He can be their new stud on the edge. I think that's where Tennessee goes. All right. The Jets, their second pick at 23. Obviously, we had them taking Zach Wilson. I think they address defensive line. I think they go Quiddy Pay. You mentioned his athleticism and all of his accomplishments uh, before, so I'll just leave it at that. I think it's a good pick for them at 23. So I do have them going uh, edge as well, the back-to-back -back edge picks here. I think this would be Michael Parsons' teammate right here, Jason Owa uh, out of Penn State. Huge frame. Like you said, uh, you wanted an athletic guy for the Jets. This guy's 6'5", 253, and he really, really turned it up at, at, at the um, – or not, there wasn't a comment. It's pro day, excuse me. Um, so it, it, it's going to be interesting to see what the Jets do here. Because that's, a, that's a big pick. I mean, everybody talks about number two, where they're already slotted in. You know, that pick's pretty much done. But number 23 is where they're really going to start building out their, they're filling out their roster uh, for next year because there's a lot of holes in it. And, and, and Edge is a great, and a great place to start. I got Jason Ellis. Yeah, I like that pick. He's got a lot of talent. 24, the Steelers, trade up candidate. But if they stick, they need a running back. Only running back that I have in the first round, I have the Steelers taking Najee Harris out of Alabama. I actually think that's a great pick, uh, and I will absolutely agree with you on it. Ooh, I, 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 it's very first. rare that you see mock drafts agree in yeah. the 20s. I, I, I do I do think that the Steelers, I mean, they just got rid of James Conner. They desperately need a running back to finish to uh, show up that offense. The defense is already established. We know what they're, what they're going to do. Um, 
Steelers actually have a team that can jump off the track boards and, and, and get into the quarterback uh, drama uh, that will be in the top half of the first round. Um, but I will agree with you. I think Najee Harris is going to be the pick for Pittsburgh. Okay. 25, the Jaguars' second first-round pick. I have them taking Trayvon Morig, the safety out of TCU. It's you have you don't see safeties go in the first round that often, but the Jaguars very need safety help badly. They drafted a corner last year with a ninth pick, CJ Henderson. They add to their young secondary with the top safety in the class out of TCU. Yeah, Jacksonville. I mean, there's so many teams here. That, I mean, every year in the NFL, there's there's, there's teams with so many holes and. and I know. Oh, this this hurts because I, I wanted to take a wide receiver here, and I was going to, but oh, it hurts. Oh man, it, I, I I hate to do it. I'm actually switching this pick, and I, I'm and I'm gonna. Oh my god, I I don't want to do this, but I'm agreeing with you. Really, back to back yeah. picks. Yeah, this will be the only time it happens ever in the history of, of, of directors cut and mock drafts everywhere. Whenever you see a mock draft from me or Nick. It will never be back to back identical picks. Especially in the, the 20s, yeah, right? Uh, outside of the top 15, there will never be back to back identical picks from us ever again. But this is where I'm going. I think Trevor Mori needs to slide in somewhere, and this is where it's going to be. All right. The Browns pick at 26. Uh, they addressed defensive line with Miles uh, Garrett. I mean, they already had him, but they Steven then Fox. Clowney ter- to Karis McKinley for a first round pick. Their weakest part in their team, to me, I think, is linebacker. They- Wilson, but they could want, and they draft Zavin Collins, the linebacker of Tulsa, and have their front seven set going in the next year. This is a tough pick, and I it, it, this was going to shock a couple people, but I'm going to go here that the Browns are not satisfied with OBJ. This is that's a wild pick. This is a wild Elijah Moore out of Ole Miss, wide receiver. I don't think the Browns are super in love with with what OBJ has given them, and he's obviously coming off a huge injury. Um, Jarvis Landry, the same way. I don't think he's like a number one guy that they can go and, and depend on day in and day out. I mean, he had some great, some nice games last year, but he wasn't that perennial top fifteen receiver that he was in um, Miami. And Richard Higgins, obviously, Donovan Gibbs Jones, who I like a lot actually. Um, but Richard Higgins obviously isn't isn't enough to that standard either. I think Elijah Moore is a sleeper, uh, really good wide receiver. At come- I mean, you said you've, you're doubling down on it. You've oh, said yeah. it the whole time. Uh, we got to go quickly here in the final two minutes with our final, like, seven picks. The Ravens pick 27th. We talked about them earlier. I have them going wide receiver here with the guy you just had go off. The f- clear cut, in my mind, the fifth best wide receiver in this class. I have them taking Elijah Moore. Mm. Yeah, that makes total sense. I mean, they need to get a receiver, and we were going to address that before. Um, they just missed out on, on Moore one pick before there, so I, I didn't have them taken. I will go though, and it, it's it's weird that they there's really nobody here. As I go down my mock draft, there's really nobody there for them to take um, as far as offensive line goes. Uh, they could do it at 31, which I might have there, but I'm gonna go with they they select Jalen Phillips out of Miami. They, you you had him already go right? Yeah, I had him you, going 18. Yeah, okay, so you had him you had him about 10 picks earlier. I think that. You lose Yannick Gakwe, you lose Matt Judon, and you have to fill something there. And, and that's where the Ravens are. Yeah, that's fair. The Saints at 28, I have them addressing corner. Janoris Jenkins getting old. Marshawn Lattimore, they need someone aside him in a tough conference with a lot of weapons. And they go Eric Stokes, the corner out of Georgia. Okay, that's fun because I have also a cornerback going here, but not the same one. I will be going with Asante Samuel Jr. out of Florida State, uh, son of former – Patriot, uh, Asante Samuel. And, uh, yeah, he's, I think actually he's going to have a really good career. I actually think he's going to be really good as well. I just think he'll go in the first five picks of the second round. Um, 29, the Packers, I think they redeem themselves for not taking oh, a weapon boy. for Aaron Rodgers we're last really year. Gonna, we're really going to be identical here. I guess, I, just said we're not gonna I guess so, because there's no other wide receiver that could be taken here other than Kadarius Toney, Ooh. the wide receiver to Florida. Oh, no, I don't have him. Oh, okay then. Terrence Marshall. I think Tony's speed and play of oh, the ball with the way he can, what he can do with the ball in his hands after he catches it is uh, more valuable than what Terrence Marshall can bring. I think Terrence Marshall's a big possession guy. I think um, 
Green Bay just really needs somebody to catch the ball. Um, Devontae Adams obviously has blue hands, and he's he's more their guy who has that quick first step and gets open at any point. Uh, Devontae Adams is, is is that guy, but um, yeah, I have him taking. Um, why don't we? Oh, Terrence Marshall. Here, I'm sorry. Yep. Uh, last three picks. Got to go quick because we're a little bit past our time. But I got the Bills. They need pass rush. I got him. Jason away. The, you mentioned them out of Penn State. Yep. Uh, Bills here. I would have. Oh my gosh. I have them taking actually Jer- Jeremiah Osu Kamaru. That'd be a good pick. I have him going a lot it'd higher. Be, it'd, it'd be a fall. That'd be a fall. It'd be yeah. a fall. The the Ravens' second pick, you mentioned offensive line. I have them going with Tevin Jenkins, the offensive tackle at Oklahoma State. Oh, so I have I'm going with the Alabama guy, Al, uh, Alex Leatherwood at an Alabama offensive line senior, 6'6", 312, he's a huge prospect. Yeah, he is a monster. He'd be able to fill in there. And with the final pick in the first round are my mock draft. The Tampa Bay Buccaneers, defending Super Bowl champions, the rich get richer, and just because of position needs, they take Christian Barmore, who I think falls up to the end oh, of the first round. Uh, that's where you have him falling. Yeah. Mm. Well, Antonio Brown coming back to the Bucs is not set in stone yet, so I will be going with Kadarius Tony. That's here. seven first-round wide receivers, seven if you weren't counting. Receivers. Yep. Boom. That's a lot. <laughs> I wanna, I'd actually like to know. I don't know off the top of my head uh, what's the most first round wide receivers ever taken because I think that's. I what, it, was it last year? It might have been last year. Was there six last year? Uh, all right. All right. Before we sign off, Tyler's going to find that all answer. Right. Most wide receivers. Well, that's going to do it anyway while he's finding that for our mock draft special. What next week in our final show? Down this, it's right that weekend. We're going to go more in depth, um, winners, losers, obviously, other than just the first round. We're going to be able to see how many picks we got right in the first round. I think last year I got seven. I think I, I, got got, seven. I, think I had a decent amount because I had most of the top ten, but then once things ha- happened after that, I think it got shaky. Yeah. Um, did you find it by chance? Uh, no. My, we, Wi-Fi's we, bad. Yeah, oh, yeah, yes, Wi-Fi's that bad. is what's going to happen here. The Wi-Fi is not going to let us find out how many wide receivers take in the first round uh, all the time. Uh, either way, fitting end, yeah, end to fitting show. end to the night show. Uh, one more for the semester, and then we'll be off until next fall, which is pretty wild. Yeah, uh, crazy. yeah. Thanks for listening, though. We'll be back for one final time, like I said, next week. Nick Roloff and Tyler Smith live on WSBU eighty-eight point three.